Good morning. Welcome into Herd Out Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. What's up, DB? What is going on? I'm just, I don't even have any idea what that happens. But... Shane, is he on? Who knows, man? It's almost like I work here, but you never know. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, he is. Actually, I'm not. Because but... I can't hear him. That's okay. I mean, I, I'd like to have a co-host today. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, it'll I be. Can't. I mean, you know, it's. It's some. I don't what? even know if somebody. Oh, I heard him. You there? Who? Yeah, there you're back. Okay. Well, I, it's totally Shane. And now you're gone. Yeah, it's totally Shane. Shane, knock it off. Oh uh, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, really good. We've got a game day today. Uh oh yeah, locally. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, it's oh, a big oh, one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see where your monarch colors, colors. Good for you. That was an accident, actually. No, it wasn't. It was. So I wore, I picked. The, no, because you know what it is? What? It's the minute we had that segment with Coach. I love Coach Williams. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah, I like him, too. But I didn't I didn't know you were going to be splitting your allegiance with the Mustangs and the Monarchs. No. So here's what happened uh-huh. is uh-huh. I wanted to wear the jeans today. Yeah. So I picked out the jeans, and I picked out a shirt that was lighter color to go with the jeans. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, so I can't go, like, the khaki quarter zip on top of the kind of yeah. khaki shirt yeah. here. Yeah. So it was really just a fashion choice, yeah. not a yeah. – R- Ravi Lula here for the Pamaran. I do like Coach Williams. Like, oh, I know. I do like Coach <laughs> you, Williams. You, yeah, you like, <laughs> talked about it for a long, 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 long time. Yeah, it'd be so it'd be a good one tonight. It's homecoming for us, which is really, 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 really late. In the I was gonna say that's really late. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention to why it wasn't an yeah. earlier game, but we had to move it. I think it was it conflicted with a holiday, maybe or something. Oh, okay. Like that. I, I thought maybe because you got something s- like that. Got some construction going on there too. I didn't know if it was yeah, a construction issue. It's an absolute circus. It is. Tried to park over there and. Tennis coach is like, yeah, you're gonna have to walk through the building with me, and I was like, thanks, thanks, ma'am. <laughs> oh, he, oh yeah, she looked out. Yeah, she did. That's cool because a lot of people just say, we always just say go around. Yeah, she's like, you, you trying to go to the football game, and I was like, yeah. She's like, you can't get through over here. Yeah, so that. Uh, but yeah, then she walked me through the building. She was super cool. Yeah, it's it's a very 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 quick turnaround. Yeah. Go Neb City. Get ready for the game. Uh, game show, and we're out. Yeah. What time are you? What time are you guys on the road tomorrow? Uh, I think wheels up at fifty tw- uh, twelve fifty five. Oh, it's a little later then. No, no, you I have still... to be on the plane by noon still. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. There that, we go. That, there that it is. is. That ain't jank. There it is. That's yeah. all right. Get off to Columbus. Yeah, I'm actually excited. Yeah. I mean, not for the travel, but I have it down to a science now. Yeah. You got it done. Uh oh yeah, yeah. Like leave back. here, get home, do shower again. Yep. I just get packed. You already packed. Yep. So just grab your stuff. Yep. Then get let, to Lincoln. Let, let the dogs out. Thirty-seven minutes. Thirty-nine okay. to the air, to pull into the airport because I have to go past. It's Thirty-seven Detroit. to campus. Four. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Thirty. It's like I listen to you sometimes, it's, but I've got to go from Ninth Street to the muni- municipal airport exit. Okay. I've right. actually never flown out of Lincoln. Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. I've never flown from inside the Lincoln Airport. Just always at the just with go the team. To, yep. Just yeah. I, even when we, you know, I was playing back in the day, we never went inside. Really? No. See, they take care of you. No, but now you have to. You, you do have to go through check. So there's this little garage bay mm-hmm. area. But now, like if you've done it once or twice, you're or you're on the regular travel party. You just show ID. You and, get kind of like waved through. Yep. And then coming back. They do security check at the stadium. It's so like it's, the clear pass. Thing. It's, it's much, much faster. Yeah, that's good. Oh, it's fantastic. See, they got this thing down. Yeah, although we waited last week. We probably sat on the plane for hour 30, maybe, hour 20 Yeah. before we took off. I don't know if they had the fuel or what, but mm-hmm. I don't know. We, I mean, it was... And it was already a not a good mood. I'm, so, I'm, so we sat. <laughs> needless to say, there was no. Ben and I did not tell any jokes. I'm gonna be honest. I I'm a little surprised that Coach Rule doesn't even have the plane people working on his schedule, where he's like, "Hey, you get fueled by the time we're there, bud. Let's go." So, so like I said, the, <laughs> oh, and he was locked too because the first, like I said, there's four buses ahead of us. They grab their second meal and 
whatever they need and they they're loading and i'm in the very back he was already air butted up on the going through it yeah yeah oof yeah it'll be it'll be interesting uh, i'm excited i do you like the fact i kind of like the fact did you catch coach sat the other day about coach rule talking to both sides of the ball mm. and meeting like yeah film yeah I, that's not normal c- no not right? common yeah but it was it was it was pretty cool because he's uh, talked about earlier in the year though how he'll yeah drop in on different meetings yep. on different sides of the ball but typically doesn't like like doesn't interject let, necessarily like to let those guys do the job yeah which is good but at the same time you know when things kind of need to get kicked in gear a little bit sometimes the CEO has to step in yeah and I like the fact that you you keep everybody on the same page mm-hmm. when you because you almost never see that yeah. Where offense and defense go over film together, together, yeah, but it but it does help if you feel like there's a disconnect, or it just alleviates it. Sure, yeah, like you don't even give it a chance to right. And I don't know how there could be a disconnect. Or, I mean, they were equally as underperforming. Right. Under one side is getting a lot more attention than the other, though. Yeah, you know. So the mayor said something to me last night. What's that? I thought was interesting. I I don't know, like. Yeah, I do. uh, so he said, I got to find it. By the way, we've added an addition to the show. Dr. Case uh, from the Con- Case Concussion Institute will talk to us at 830 if you want to slide that in. Which Yeah, Dr. Uh, one, one of the better experts around the country is right here in our very own backyard. Yeah, Dr. Todd Case. He's the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Case Concussion Institute right here in Omaha. Um that and, and honestly, the reason this is my fault actually because <laughs> because it you, is it is actually you but, know him but I do like to appease. So I met him through DJ. Yeah, yeah, okay. And obviously, we've had uh, you know a young men go see him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Just you're a football coach. That makes sense, right? Yeah. And so we were talking. You were talking about Tua Monday. Yeah, and I, I put him on the rundown again today because I, I just can't. And I, I went through the rundown last night, and I'm like, you know what? If you really can't shake it, because I know it's bugging you. It is. It bugs me a lot. So I didn't talk to him until 6 this morning. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that he was, on it. I was like, well, the funny thing was, no, DJ was like, hey, good morning. Yeah. And we were just talking about some other, oh, we're talking about the game tonight. Yeah. You know, our mindset and stuff. And I, he said, hey, did you get in touch with Doc? And I said, Yeah. Coincidentally, I reached out to him about 10 <laughs> minutes ago, which was weird to say because it's barely 6 o'clock. Right, so. yeah. But I did say, hey, apologize for the early text. But I didn't want to text late last night yeah. because it's late. So I figured. Early better than late. Well, I knew that they opened at 8. Okay. So he's, yeah. So I'm like. Mm, he's got to get rolling pretty early. He doesn't strike me as the type of guy that's hitting that thing at 710. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So Not hitting the snooze button a bunch. <laughs> yeah. And when you said it's still bugging you, I yeah. was like. Well, the Grayson McCall thing brought it back up in, I know, in my yeah. head. Yeah. You know, so Grayson McCall, the, he was at Coastal Carolina, kind of helped Jamie Chadwell rise to prominence at Carolina, that Coastal, and then transfers to NC State and just announced that he retired from football because of multiple head injuries. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, here's this college kid, and I get the money's different, and I get this whatever, right? And you're a bit – you that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Like you have an affinity for I – like, I like Grayson McCall. I watched him a ton at Coastal. Um, Everybody wanted him when he hit the transfer portal. Yeah, one of a super high profile prospect. I love Jamie Chadwell, although he had a rough night. Um, yeah, how about Kennesaw State? First FBS win ever. Uh, but so I'm watching this this Grayson McCall thing play out, and I just keep thinking back to Tua. So I actually went back and watched the press conference again. Yeah, and I just could not get over how casual he seemed about it. And so I just keep. I was like, does he? I was like, does he not get it? Does he get it? And that's I, I thought it was interesting in the rundown you put, it's still bugging me. It is. And I was like, well, you don't have to tell me that. And the I'm, rundown is for me. <laughs> well, it's for me, too. Honestly, it's, probably, it's, for, it's for both of us because sometimes I'll think of something. I don't want to forget it, so I just yeah. put it on there. Uh, so there's some spoilers on there for you sometimes. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, I'm just – I don't know if it's because I just don't feel like he's taking it seriously, which, again, it's his life, whatever. But I, I, I don't – if – if people are friends with me, and I think I've done this to you actually, I have when people are trying to make really tough decisions or something's going on in their life, mm-hmm. 
the thing that I feel like I provide value in sometimes within that decision making process when people come to me is making sure they understand the choices they're making. Mm. Right. So whether it's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in this relationship. I don't know what to do, whatever. Or I got this job offer. I don't know what to do, whatever. I just try and help people un- like see the big picture because I know personally, sometimes when you're in it, you get blinders on a little bit. Right. And so I just I think I can provide value in being like, hey, here's here's the choice that you're ac- actually making and the repercussions to that choice. And so you're going back and you're listening to Tua. And you're I like, don't think anybody did that. Nah, see, I disagree. That well, that's the vibe I got from his tone. I he comes or across, he didn't get it. He comes across as a guy. I don't know. He came across as someone that was willing to is willing to deal with the consequences. See, the reason I say I don't think he understands the consequences is because he compares it to things that are just not in the same yeah, ballpark. It's not the, the analogy, the driving to work. Yeah, there's some. It's like, not good. It, and that one, that one I could even deal with, but it was the. I mean. You so, can roll so your one, so one of the things I want to ask Doc is, yeah. um, is there that is there the minimum is there a natural minimization, mm, like within the the player's mind? Yeah, yeah. Is there a net or you think it would almost be to the contrary that you would over analyze it? I think it depends on the person. Honestly. Yeah, well, clearly, but yeah, but I, I think also, and I think I brought this up when Tua got hurt originally. I think it's really difficult for people. Like he said, he felt normal again the day after the game. So do you remember a couple of weeks ago when yeah. we went? When I, it was random, mm-hmm. but I was just looking at the game Miami had. I think it was one and two at the time or something. And I go, you know what the timeline for two is? I said, does he come back after the bye in, yeah. in week eight? It was just kind of random. Yeah, off the cuff. And I and I got two I got two DMs and it was basically they're just messing with me. It's like there's no way. Yeah, he's coming back. He's shutting it down. I said he should take. And the I season. and I go and I said, well, I, I said it was more rhetorical, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't surprise me if he feels good at, by now. Yeah, and that was a couple four, weeks ago, a few weeks, three, three, three four weeks. Yeah, ago, it was like yeah. a week after we went on IR. Yeah. So, well, because that's what you hear from guys all the time, right? Is like after a few days, I felt fine. Yeah, but what you feel and what's happening internally within your brain are not always the same thing, right? Uh, and coincidentally, we had a player yesterday that was out in sunglasses, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I knew, you know, right away, it's like, okay, yeah, he wants to be out here with us, but yeah, he's dealing with, some de- stuff. Dealing with some dealing with the, the light. And so it was just on my brain. So yeah. when I reached out, he, he was, he was pretty cool about it. So that'll be at eight thirty. but I wanted, you said something about equal, the, Equal. I was talking about with the film and mm-hmm. equal, and we're mad at one guy more than the other. Yeah, that's been bothering me a lot this week. Okay, so listen. So, so the mayor hits me with this. He said was slammed with work this morning. So just catching up on the show now. He said I feel like everyone is upside down on their criticisms. In my opinion, the offense moved the ball. The defense and special teams were abysmal. Complimentary football is a two way street. Satterfield getting a lot of heat that should be on white with the arms up emoji. It, agree? Yeah, I think. Well, I, yes. Okay, so let's yeah. say let's say he's right. Mm-hmm. Do you know why I think that is? Other than, I mean, because we kind of dumb it down and we say, "Oh, we like a guy," versus we don't like a guy. I Do boil you, it down to track record. Okay, so that's part of it. Yeah, uh, and also I think we feel some type of way about the press conference. Yeah. However ridiculous it was. 100%. That's, yes. That's a big part of it. I really think so. Like, if Satterfield is better in front of the media. Even though I told you, I'm like, I don't think he understood the question. Yeah, I agree. I, I 100% agree. He was talking about staying on schedule. Somebody else was talking about a metric. Yeah. Right? That's how I took it. And I think that's probably how it was intended. And that's why yesterday I wasn't concerned about it. I was concerned about some other stuff he said that I didn't love. But I wasn't particularly concerned about the four to six yards. I and I even said yesterday, I didn't I didn't love Tony White's press conference. He was just more confident. Like he's talking about stuff where he's like, "Oh man, there was some stuff on schematics I would not do again." Like that's a little concerning to no, me. No, but I'm telling you that happens. I'm sure it does. But it, oh, way more than you. But think. it doesn't hit my ear great either. Hey, so like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna sit here and, and assume the worst out no, of Satterfield, no, no, I'm t- listen. I'm telling you, see that stuff happens. And it happens. Now you can like why it. 
You okay? I, I'm not gonna let you off the hook, but I will say this: if after I explain this and you say that's why you don't like it, okay, then I'll be okay. Go ahead. Because what happens is, I told you when you're when you're coordinating something, most times you'll start with formations, mm -hmm. tendencies. Uh, and then kind of what they do off of their contingencies. Then you look and you say, okay, this is how how can how we want to play take advantage or 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 line up with this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we we we're technically an odd front, but we need to we worry constantly about mirroring coverages behind the front. So. We thought it would be a good idea. I'm not even going to talk about the front. What happens is, is you'll come up with fronts. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we want to give a different look here, or we want to shake this up here. Three man, four man, five man, whatever. Right. Yeah. So, I can think of two distinct occasions where we're like, "Oh, didn't really look good in practice." But when we're scripting plays, sometimes we like to go worst case scenario to see how it looks. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're this deal, and it's like, ah, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, maybe they'll get it. It's early in the week. Mm -hmm. Both times we left the game, and we're like, yeah, I didn't really like that. <laughs> Not doing that again. Yeah, like I'm, I'm dead serious. Like it happens. Yeah, it, it looks, it, can, it look, it can look good, and you think schematically, and you're like, ooh, I have this accounted for, and this accounted for, and whether it's you guys aren't comfortable, with, you hope that's not it. Mm -hmm. Right, because you probably shouldn't be calling anything that you're like mm -hmm. that the guys aren't comfortable with, right? You know, but if it looks good and you, but then you get out in the game, it looks and good. and you haven't seen enough of the variations of what they want to do, and you're still in it, it can cause you, it can cause some paralysis. So I could see, yeah, where he would say that. I can see how it. Happens. I don't think that's why you're mad no, about it's, it. It's not, but that does that does happen. I'm not gonna coaches will tell you, man. It's like, ooh, I think this should work against this, and then you get out there, and it's like, eh, it didn't work. Yeah, so it's not for me, and this I could be totally wrong. I'm not gonna let myself off the hook either, because that's not what I meant. Like it's just not. <laughs> It'd be really easy to sit here and be like, yeah, oh yeah, that makes sense. I mean, like I'd like him to be prepared for the variations to a degree. That's, that's not why you're happen. mad, though. No, not at all. Um, but I'm just being totally honest. That's never crossed my mind. Um, <laughs> well, it's fine. No, I mean, I appreciate the honesty. It, the reason it bothered me is, and this could be a completely unreasonable ask, and I don't know, is if he thought something was going to work, and then it obviously wasn't, like from the jump, uh -huh. would have liked to see it go because, to something else. All right, that's fine, but he's not talking about base. He's talking about calls. No, I, I know. Right? So we <laughs> – Coach – But like a – Almost none of it worked, C Coach, right? C Coach Queen and I go back and forth over this co particular coverage all the time. Yeah, you yeah, hate man-to-man. Man. That's not it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He's got you brainwashed, too. I don't hate man-to-man. -man. <laughs> I know. I just I knew it was going to make you mad. <laughs> How do you know that? Because you told me. You don't like playing man to man against mobile quarterbacks because you have your back turned to them and they take off. I'm very you. specific. I'm third and short because I don't like us <laughs> turning our backs to quarterbacks that can scramble. But anyway. Oh, dang. Man. <laughs> Wait till I get home to Coach Queen. <laughs> um, so sometimes, like, you'll, you'll make calls. Yeah. You, you, there will be like a three by or a two by two or backs and pistol, and you'll say, okay, hey, they know typically we do this normally. Mm -hmm. Let's try this. So you may roll it a couple times, and it doesn't it just doesn't work. It doesn't yield the results you get now. And what we don't know is when he called it, they may have gotten gashed. Yeah, right. So he's like, "Fudge that those those." Let's say it's only three calls out of sixty six snaps. Mm -hmm. Those three calls might have amassed all touchdowns, ninety Maybe. yards, or, or whatever, because yeah. you don't really know. Yeah. So his delivery let me know, like. Yeah, I don't know. those weren't good. So you, you know, and he's like, you'll always want some of those back. Yeah, which I get. I, I'm t I'm telling you, and it didn't turn out to be a big deal. Yeah. What, what was I mad about after the the Bellevue West game when I was like, man, Coach Huffman got me. Uh, there. Oh God, what was it? It was we we tried to play call. Yep. He got out of he he did something different. Yeah, and he, he didn't just convert the first down. He they scored. Yeah. Yeah, they scored. What was the what was the play call? Or what was it, was it? Was fourth and one, and he took a shot. Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and typically the way that they lined up, he he had a tendency. Yeah. Nah, you put that thing in the air. 
<laughs> and and we played man. Yeah. We're like, oh, you know, fit in the run game. You yep. can use free safety. It's going to be edge run game. Nah. Nope. Just he won out on the perimeter and he hit his head on the goalpost. <laughs> I just looked. And I was like, "Yeah, you know what? Tip your cap." Got me. So sometimes, so sometimes that no, happens, and I I get that, and that's kind of my point, though. It's weird how I remember that, but it I that's just, kind of my point, I though, guess. with Tony White is like that's a thing that struck me as it didn't sound great, but I also don't now think that's an indictment of Tony White as a football coach. Like we give Tony White the benefit of the doubt. And whether that's because he's more confident, because the pressure sounds better, because of the track record, because we just like him more, I don't know. But sometimes that happens, though. Right, but like it also happens that an offensive coordinator doesn't totally understand the question you're asking, and he answers something else. Oh, you're talking about the balance. Yeah, I'm talking about how we treat them differently, even though I don't think, like, in terms of content, I don't know that either of them had a great presser in terms of delivery. Tony White's was dramatically better than Marcus yeah, Satterfield. I guess I, I'm just I'm a lot more sympathetic because it's happened. Sure. Just just last year, we're in the city championship. It's a youth game. Yeah. It's against Hoskinson, right? It's all it's all it's all emotional and heated. And these kids are good. <laughs> and uh, we had beat him earlier in the season. He comes out and they were smaller than us. Mm -hmm. He comes out. He runs like three toss plays in a row. Yeah. I'm like, fudge. I'm like, this dude's just going to run it down our throat. He, cause he's very, he was very, very good with the clock. Mm -hmm. He, he, he just was really good. He just good clock management. And I'm like, fudge. He's even running it to the boundary. Yeah. So I, I wanted to play some three so we could get a, another guy down into the box. This son of a gun on the fourth play throws a halfback pass and they scored. <laughs> I didn't, I don't wear hats. Yeah. And, and I, pretended to have a hat on i said hey Haas. i just tipped my cap yeah right like sometimes that hat now it's not like I, you don't say hey stay as deep as the deepest man in your zone yeah. it was not an ideal thing to be running for somebody that's gonna run half back pass sure right yeah so it's like yeah i want that call back that was terrible right like he I, you got it but but so i it, it happens no i get it to me it's not about the specifics it's about hey we're all we're willing to say it happens for Tony White. We're not willing to say it happens for Marcus Satterfield. And they had an equally bad day. Yeah, but I'm telling you, the, the track record thing there matters. No, it does. And, I get it. And so does the delivery. And the, so does the delivery. The delivery. The track record, I think, should matter. The delivery, I think, is what matters to us more and in reality matters less. Well, that and the fact we don't like a guy. Ooh, some people don't matter what I say. They're just not going to like it. Well, we see that and we see that all the time. Welcome to the Internet. That's DBM Rob Blue. We'll be back. More Herd Out Sports Radio coming up next. Welcome back to Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DBM Rob Blue. We're here at Herd Out Sports Bar and Grill, where you can join us a week from tomorrow and for the pregame live show before UCLA. And special treat for you. We've partnered with Tickets for Less we're going to give away four tickets and a parking pass to that UCLA game right here awesome. on the show. Make sure you come hang out. Got to be present to win. Go to eventbrite.com and reserve your spot. Search for Herd at Sports Radio. DB coming up on the show today. Well, I know you know, but we'll tell everybody else, I guess. You know. Matt Marinas, our buddy from White and Blue Review. Let's go. He's got quite a bit of versatility and range, but we'll start We'll start doing a little tiny sneak peek of some college basketball with him. 8.30, as you mentioned, we got Dr. K's of the K's Concussion Institute. Uh, we'll talk to him about Grayson McCall, Tua, whatever we can think of, just all the things that are bothering me right now about yeah. head injuries. 8.45, we got our guy Brian Edwards, our Vegas insider. 9, we've got Michael Brunts. And then we wrap up the show with Bob Nightingale covering Major League Baseball for USA Today because we got a World Series that's starting pretty soon. Yes, we do. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. There was, there's no doubt about what I will be doing tomorrow night in the hotel. Just relaxing, maybe watch a movie. No. Yep, a yeah, movie. <laughs> a movie. Just talking to people about why you hate man to man defense. <laughs> and... <laughs> I don't even know what you're laughing she at. Like to be, that one. To be honest, I, I see you hanging out at the bar. Yeah, that's with, not the, with a bunch of people. Although our <laughs> our producer from and I mean he is a treat. Yeah, we'll just call him Nick. Yeah, like Jagger for for, for Big Red Wrap Up down in Lincoln is a Columbus native. Yeah, I've told you about him before. Kind of wears throwbacks and always is like his shoe game. Is he's always got cool tennis shoes. Yeah, but he's out there. You can totally tell. This my man. 
grew up in the 70s. And he's like, hey, I got a spot for you. And <laughs> we're just talking as I'm walking out. Me and Jay Moore, and I was like, man, do I take him up on this offer? Because I should. Did you hit that spot up? Yeah, and he looks like a hole-in-the-wall kind of guy. Yeah. like You do love a hole-in-the-wall. Like low-key. But the turnaround is amazingly fast. Yeah. Because that first bus, B-Mac is on the six. he's on the first bus out. Mm. I'm like, I don't know, man. It's Ooh, like, he's a bus six guy? Can't we just Uber? <laughs> <laughs> so, but then, but usually Jess and Alex, the rest of the crew will, like, get an Uber. Yeah. So I'm like, is the 40 minutes worth it? Should I just watch baseball? Can I watch baseball and not and get volume? <laughs> Just like I did the last time when I ordered sushi on DoorDash, I'll be staying inside. I still don't understand. I mean, you, you explained how, so I get it. But man, that's so far down on the list of stuff I would order on DoorDash. I got a, I had a steak um, in Indy. That's a better decision. I walked too. That's a worse decision. My house is I going to get there. <laughs> Jitney. <laughs> It's close. It's what's a, a it's what's a, a jitney. It's a total college town. <laughs> what Indy? Yeah, and yeah. as I was leaving to pick up the food, it, like that's why I told you, Port now it was coming in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I actually I'm I don't really have an allegiance to either of these teams, but I I'm actually glad. I have no teams. good experiences in Columbus. Oh no, I was talking about the World Series. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I have no good recent <laughs> experiences since COVID with the World Series with the Yankees. No, I. Wow. What? Why you had to bring up old stuff? I you could have stayed a little more relevant with what was going on in the 2020s. Really? I'm surprised you didn't bring up 2018. You went from 2018 to 1978. I just don't. I just assume nobody's got good experiences with the Yankees, Fuck. except for our guy D. Marinas. What will the? Oh, I know. It, but it's it's friendly between he because he's not he's not he, a trash talker. No, he understands yeah. like that stuff. Yeah. The. We care about that stuff. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I'm glad this is what the. What you know what I'm going to ask him is. about? What's that? His low key man crush for Coach Rule. I know it's it's been developing. I love it because he the like the clips on our group text that mm -hmm. he likes from the press conferences are it's yeah. it is right there in my. It's wheelhouse. the same stuff that I like. Yeah, I'm like, but he seems a lot nicer than me. Yeah. Um, that's not true. No, Matt's low key pretty snarky. Oh no, I can tell. He's nice. He's got me. Yeah, I can tell. He's nice to you right now because you guys don't know each other as well yet. But like, when you get to know him, he's gonna start. He'll get you. He'll start he's, sniping you. He's got me over the past couple of years. I mean, he's no Padilla, but that's your... <laughs> Padilla's probably actually a nicer person. But like, he just he'll cut you. You just don't see it coming. Hey, so should his Packers be more in the discussion? We kind of glossed over them yesterday. I stop it. I I think Matt Lafleur is really good. Yeah, he's fantastic. I don't know if I think Jordan Love's really good. Ooh, why do why are his eight interceptions different than Mahomes? Same reason that Marcus Satterfield's track record is different than Tony White's. <laughs> Boy, this it's hot. It's hot today. <laughs> it feels it it feels like a Friday, and I know good and well it isn't. It's a lot of snark. A lot of snark. You gotta roll back and do it one more day. At least our stream has calmed down. That <laughs> thing was a circus for like oh, four days. Yeah, they were popping. The our stream was not handling. I feel like the, they. I Indiana feel like people. Well. I feel like people were being mean to Kobe too, and he's not in this morning. I don't think he's in this morning either. I'm gonna say what's up to the stream real quick. Um, I am. Best? I am not. I just watch. You just, <laughs> just like to monitor everything that's going on. What's that? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like with Columbus, I, I don't have any like really fun yeah. memories of, of post games there or anything. But I do like the fact that I'm gonna. See, I this isn't some because you hear that. Well, this game will tell us a lot. What, what do you be specific? Like, what do you mean? Because I think people will look for another reason to to jump ship. Yeah, right in a game in which you're already. 26 point underdogs so what what like what will it tell you like right. and what are you looking for yeah it's one of those things that they're not going to define it because then they can change their answer afterward right like it gives them leeway to be emotional about whatever they want to be but i'll be honest i i'm hearing basically two things from the fan base okay what are we hearing i'm hearing what you're hearing hey this will tell us a lot 
And, yeah, then, and I haven't delved into specifics. I just yeah, you're seeing a lot. My social media game has been. And then it's a short week on the so I haven't been. Yeah, yeah on the other side of it, yeah. I'm getting basically. Which this is, and this is the thing that actually really bothers me, is people are acting like it'll be a miracle if Nebraska shows up and doesn't lose by seventy. And I don't like. Listen, I get Nebraska's probably not going to win this game. Am I the? I maybe you're this way too. I have no idea. Mm. Like I think they could win the game. I don't think they will. But I don't think it's impossible. People are talking like it is a it is a physical impossibility to win this football okay, game. Okay, but listen, I'm gonna say this, and I'm certainly not. I, I'm going kind of going back in my head. I'm not like. It seems like I've been a little pro fan this week. I'm not pro fan. I'm just. I don't like to legislate it. Okay, so I'm gonna say this, and I'm I'm gonna say that, and I'm gonna move on. Okay. What I think is, there's still. Ch- it's the transitive property in sports that, that you know I hate, you hate. Yeah, because if Indiana exist. wins 56 7, well, what's Ohio State going to do? Right. And as doesn't low matter. hanging of fruit as that sounds, that's just the na- Because it's the freshness mm-hmm. of, of, of the scar. It hasn't even scarred over yet. I get it. It's still, it's still bleeding. It's no yeah, problem. Yeah, it's still tender. I get it. Like my knuckle from the door scrape. I thought you stopped doing that. Well, I didn't redo it. It's just, it was two weeks ago, and it's still hurting me. Two weeks ago? Was it three weeks ago? I mean, you got to get some, like... Get some was ne- it three weeks ago that I did it? No, it's two. I, you got to, like, get some Neosporin on there or something, mm-hmm. man. I'm, I'm, Listen, I'm not trying to legislate how people are being fans. Dirt on it. No, like Neosporin because it's actual, like, medicine. I don't think Neosporin is good for you anymore. I don't I know. I think... De- who told, somebody told me that. That's no big deal. There are certain people in life that would tell you that that I wouldn't trust a lot. I think with, I heard that Neosporin isn't good for you. I wouldn't me. trust a lot with medical Is questions. Is it Neosporin or chips? It's something. But anyway. <laughs> Those are different things. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's, a, that's totally on me. <laughs> I'm so, not so trying... Sometimes I think out loud. I'm not trying to legislate how people are being fans. I just don't know how they go through life. Like, I, like genuinely, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I don't know how you walk through your life if you're like, oh, this is, you know, something one, this bad thing happened, right? I get it. Mm-hmm. The Indiana was a, that was a bad day, bad week. B- b- pick your time frame. It was bad. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you then continue to go through life and you're like, oh God, Ohio State. That's, listen, Ohio State's really good. Ohio State's probably going to win this game. 98% chance they win this game. I also just saw Liberty lose to Kennesaw State, which is by far the worst team in FBS right now. Do you know? That was a bigger spread than the Nebraska. Do you know why I went to Kennesaw State when we were in Atlanta a couple years ago for hoops? Why? I want to see their baseball facility because it's nice. Yeah. I didn't know their football team was going to pull this off about... That would have been... Caleb was in eighth grade. That would have been four years ago, five this years ago. This was their first FBS win. No, I'm well aware. Liberty's <laughs> good. Yeah. TK was losing his. They've mind. got one of the best coaches in the country. Yeah, well, they've according, got, according to you, they've got. They do. <laughs> they've got a ton of dudes that were either playing at Power Five or were wanted by Power Five. Yeah. They've got all the money in the world. You're telling me there's a bigger gap between Nebraska and Ohio State than there is between Kennesaw and Liberty? I'm not buying it. That's DB. I'm Robin. We'll be back. <laughs> Welcome back to Heard Out Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. Remember, make sure if you're driving, you've got your seatbelt fastened. Make sure it clicks. It prevents injuries and saves lives, but only when worn properly. This message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Uh, DB, before we talk to our guy, Matty DeMarinas, who we love dearly, right? Big Matty Matty DeMarinas, guys. He's a Texans fan, too, I think. Yeah, he is. So that could we. I'm interested how he feels about C.J. Stroud. Probably yeah, he, better than he did about Sean Watson, range. but he does. Big boxing guy too. Were you? Su- oh, yeah, he loves boxing. I watch. I've watched several Crawford fights I'm with gonna, him. I'm gonna have to hook him and Newhouse up. Yeah. Yeah, Newhouse. Nate's like in it, right? I mean, all the way. It doesn't yeah. matter the weight class, random, obscure. Like we'll talk about guys. Like, I mean, young up and comers. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm. I. I hate to say it because I don't like saying nice things about my friend, but I'm, <laughs> Newhouse has range. He, he has he has rage. I love that. I don't like saying nice things about my friends. <laughs> what? I've I've noticed. <laughs> no, I wanted to get into so nobody calls. So nobody calls and asks me to hang out. <laughs> hey, what are you doing tonight? 
next time I hear that, it'll be the first. <laughs> That's actually not true. He's always like, I'm staying at home. <laughs> All right, 100% yeah. of the time. All right, good point. Uh, I wanted to talk a little NFL before we get into Matty DeMarinas here. Because there's some uh, there's some interesting games this weekend. Yeah, very much so. I think it's a good weekend. I think it's a good re- weekend kind of across high school, college, and NFL. Maybe not as high profile as some of the some of the weeks we've had, but we got, we got a big one in high school tomorrow too. We get Matty Terman. What time is the what time is Terman? Is he seven forty three? He's at seven forty three tomorrow. He, he needs a bigger set. Get, get that dude. It's hilarious. Get the Terminator. Uh, that's uh, uh, Elkhorn North. Yeah, Scott Elkhorn North. How about that, the, I'm I gotta ask him. Hey, when those district when those district allocations came out, how'd you how'd you feel? I mean, he probably feels better now. That he broke Bennington's forty six game win streak. It's just a gauntlet. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They're, that district, their their district is 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 a monster. But hey, you make it out of that alive, you can do anything. Shoot, that's how we feel, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's nice. Do you know off the top of your head? And I apologize for putting you on the spot like this. Do you know off the top of your head if Miller North is in the playoffs if they win or lose? I th- they're in regardless. Yeah. All right, that's what I like to hear. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know they got Columbus. They're both four and four. I just I wasn't sure what the standards yeah, were like. Miller, Miller North is in. No, they could go from like a the seeds could, twelve to a fifteen. Yeah. Um, but losing last week was the one that really messed up their seed, right? Because yeah, they could the have had a five. The team that I'm curious about was it's shit, and I shouldn't because it's not. It's really none of my business except they've been there for thirty straight years. I think I think prep is must win to get in. Yeah. Oof. That's they've they've had they've had a little bit of a I think, challenging I season. I think it's must win. That's that's a tough spot. But our district is flipping. That's brutal. It, yeah, it's. I mean, it's not bees. No, but, but it's it's the gauntlet of of a. When you get a sec, mm-hmm. go look at Blair's schedule. Oof, I'm afraid to for mm. their sake. Mm. Mm. Man, so we'll talk to Matty Terman tomorrow. He's got a big one coming up. But there's. And I think you guys are the only game tonight, right? Because the South Benson one's uh, forfeited, right? Yeah, Motor South, yeah. Yeah. Um, Motor South is going to have, I think, over 44 points. Yeah. It ha- and has two Division Four wins, which is hard yeah. to do. Yeah. Like, that's pretty good. <laughs> no, I mean, they've had a nice year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like... They've had a pretty good year. I, I remember... Uh, was it, it was Miller North, so I hate to even talk about it. But they were they had forty four points in week week seven, mm-hmm. about seven or eight years ago. Which the wild card points are based on division wins. You get a lot of a certain amount of points. The better win you have over teams with winning records, the more points you accrue. We'll finish with somewhere in the forty sixes, which is high, mm-hmm. like almost a full point higher than anybody else, I think. But Miller North had that almost that in week seven. That's how good their schedule was. Yeah, I think everybody they played that year was in the playoffs. How do the um, yeah, just no, I know I, everybody they played made the playoffs. I, I remember. <laughs> um, how does it work with these out of state games that people are starting? So that I don't know. I I was I asked um, Newhouse on the side after, but he said he'd have to wait and see how Basha finished. Mm, okay. So they do it kind of retroactively. It's wait, yeah, it's weighted. It's weighted afterwards. Yeah, because like Miller North got one of those two at Cherry Creek. Yeah, and you'd like to see. So we we did it once during COVID. Coach Frank ended up getting a game with a team from Kansas City. But mm-hmm. what are you gonna do for? You want to be playing. Yeah, they played half a game, then no game, and then and North Platte. Yeah, they'll play. You know, but. It's not like they're playing a ton of football no. late. They've played one game in like a month, basically. By the time they'll, yeah, you know, because not I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but it's not like the one half was a real high effort half, you know. So yeah. we're talking about one full game in a month leading up to the playoffs. Like, I don't know if it's gonna matter, but I I wouldn't and, love it. I'm yeah. sure Coach Wisdom doesn't love it. And you could look up, and I mean, it's it's good. It's thank goodness Carney plays well because like Carney's gonna play a three seed or yeah. be a three seed. So with every win that they – how about their bounce back? Car- Carney's good. For, with every win that they rack up, that helped. Yeah. Mozart quite a bit. Absolutely. Um, I did want to – there. I did want to get the NFL a little bit here because I think there's not – How are you going to skip college? We'll get to college later. I got college on the schedule. Man. I like college too. I just said that because my back hurt us sometimes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't think there's a lot of – It's totally made up. <laughs> last – 
Last... I, don't, I don't care what we talk about. <laughs> Last week, I felt like there were a lot of kind of marquee matchups. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot of make or break matchups this week. I'll give you one, and it's early. NFL. What's that? Vikings Rams. Yes, that one. I see. I don't. El Stinko. It's just two and a half. Well, so that's stinky for a different reason. Yeah. But I don't think that may it might make or break the Rams season. The Rams I, are two and four. I don't think it does for the Vikings. No, but that division could. But that division could get away from him in a hurry. So, are you one of those guys that think three are in? Yeah, I think so. It's. I mean, I don't know how you keep three. I don't know how you keep one of them out. Detroit, Green Bay, and Minnesota. I think so. Although it wouldn't. I don't know. The the Bears are going to have the advantage of a bad schedule. The Bears may have the best defense overall. Yeah, and Caleb Williams is like yeah, he's, he's coming getting along. He's, he's getting, getting better. He looks. They have good offensive weapons. Too. You know, and so I think it's Vikings Lions for sure. I'm not sure about the other one. Oh my. Yeah, I don't. Vikings and Lions. No, that's Lions and Tigers. What? Wait a minute. Bears. The other one. So, oh my. You're that's. I think you're low key throwing I'm shade putting, at the Packers. I'm not throwing shade. I just think they're below the Vikings and, and Lions. I think those are the two best teams in the in the division. So is Jamison Williams going to be suspended or not? Yeah, it's going to be two games. Well, be- I don't have any idea what he's doing, but I cheer for him. This is terrible mm-hmm. because I'm not condoning. I don't I'm not condoning bad behavior. And at some point, you got to snap out of it. But man, he's got one of the craziest stories yeah. ever. So I I, I kind of just cheer for him. Yeah, you you. But I don't want you to keep doing silly stuff and and having and it be okay. Get so. away with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like at a certain point, it's hey, let's figure this out. So I get, he's looking at is it two games max potentially? I I don't know if it's max, but it sounds like it's gonna be two games. So that's why I thought Detroit may go get another wide receiver. But apparently, only the Steelers and and Chiefs. The Chiefs do. Yeah. By the way, selfish. How about? Do you see the the compensation? Let's just call Hopkins for a fourth because... Yeah. Wait, is it only a fourth if they get to the Super Bowl? I think so. Yeah, I'd assume they get to the Super Bowl, saying, but... I'm going to call it a fourth. All right, let's just call it a... Let's call it a fourth. And the Titans are paying for half a salary. Yeah, I feel like they got the better end of how to bargain because... Yeah. What we... I think we gave up a... Was it a second or a third for Cup? Uh, second? I'm like, wait a minute. We we paid more for a guy coming off multiple ankle surgeries than the Chiefs did. Well, for... who's who's worth more, DeAndre Hopkins or Devontae Adams? What do you mean worth? Like, who would you pay more for? Who would, if you're trading for either one of them? Like, if you're sitting there, probably. Gosh, I think this is a harder question than people think it is. <sighs> I think people's this, gut is that Adams has been better more recently, and I don't know that that's the case. I think worth, like show, like consistency. Okay, I'm probably gonna take D Hop. I think so too. I just think I know what I'm getting. Yeah, and D. I mean, they're basically the same age. Thirty one. D Hop's thirty two. Uh, Adams is thirty one. Okay. Uh, they're. This is totally off the top. Top. The last. Good season they each had was basically last year. Now Adams was at eleven hundred yards. D Hop was at a thousand. Right? They both had. Well, I think actually D Hop had more touchdowns because Devonte had zero last year. <laughs> no disrespect, Shane. And D Hop had nine. None taken. So if I'm looking at that, I can't. Believe, I don't know why you're out. And you think? And has D Hop been more or less dramatic than Devonte Adams? No, I could see that. So, if I'm giving up a fourth or fifth for Devonte or for D Hop or a second or or a third or fourth for Devonte Adams, mm. and I'm only paying half that salary, I feel pretty good if I'm Kansas City. Yeah, I mean that's a good it's it's a good pickup. I don't think. I mean I know it way. We're God, back. God bless JB. We're back here on our Dad Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're joined now by our friend. Matt D. Marinas from the White and Blue Review. What's up, Matty? My guys, how are we? How are we? How are how are things, Matty? Good, good. You know what? Uh, is your music still playing? I don't know. Hey, listen. I can still hear it. Uh, <laughs> hey, Shane, figure it out. 
<laughs> All right, how's that, Matty? Is that better? Hey, it's cool. I can vibe with it. Yeah. I just wanted to know. Just, you know, <laughs> know it Christmas. It's Shane's first time, by the way. Yeah. You know, uh, I was thinking about this because I, I think one of the things I like the most about Robbie is uh, he's a guy you can have a conversation with, and you can you can be confident that it's a judgment free zone. Yeah. And I and I learned this. I guess this was like really enhanced my belief in this when he was talking to you a few weeks ago <laughs> and it was right around like the first freeze of the season. Yeah. And you were telling him how it got to 53 degrees in your house or whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's not the shocking part. The shocking part was that you looked him straight in the eye <laughs> and you said as a li- lifelong resident of the state of Nebraska <laughs> that you sleep with your windows open in the winter. You're out. You're out. And he just, and he just like, mm-hmm, not it. And like, didn't, he, didn't even like his, his, his blood pressure level didn't raise at all. Like he, he, it is the like, honest like to goodness to truth. People. Yeah. God is my is, witness. I would have conducted a psyche eval on the spot, <laughs> like immediately. I would have, I would have started asking all the questions. Cause yeah, I mean, now, that's the most, <laughs> that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, I, I know what number. I just like it. So, oh man, man. Like, you know we get detectives, right? There's a dash I'm not, in front of some of those numbers. I'm not. I'm like, not. I'm not doing it. I, I was going to try to rationalize it, but it's only going to it's gonna sound worse. I heard that, and I go, how is Robbie not – how is he just staying cool about that? Like, that, that – I would have so many questions. Like, the show would be derailed for the rest of the day. It's, yeah. I, so, yeah. Yeah. a couple of things there, Matt. Number oh, one oh, – Okay, relax over there. I think a lot of people, when they hear me, think judgment-free. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that's the first thing people think when they think Robbie. They're oh, like, yeah, a guy never has I any was, strong opinions. No, He's judge, never I was, wrong. I mean, yeah. I was like, <laughs> judgment-free Robbie. Yep, 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 yep. Second, second, <laughs> this dude says so many things that are just totally out of pocket that leaving his window open all year, like, didn't even register. I I was, like, amazed. I was like, where is – I'm like, how is he not even the, reacting? The bar like is so high now, Matt. It's so high. That leave like leaving the window open when it's negative twenty out is not even. It's like, man, that that checks out. Almost, Sounds about almost right. Almost knocking myself out by washing my face. <laughs> that that raised that raised some questions. <laughs> Matt, I do have a question though before we get to the brass tacks because this kind of gives me a snapshot. If you're like old school Oscar Goldman and you're like building your your six million dollar man, although it'd be like a fifty six million dollar coach or whatever now, and you get the personality traits of your faves, like. What are you taking from, like, Coach Flan, Coach Booth, Coach Rule? Because the, these are these are coaches. I'm going to throw Coach Mack in there, too. I tried to guess the ranking of your affinity for those guys, and I went I went Flan, Kirsten, Mack, Matt. Is that right? I, yeah, I don't even know if I've ever done that exercise <laughs> before. Um, I just go by your social media game and, and what how you, you talk, talk to us and how you talk to us. Yeah, you got you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, by the way, we talk to us. The rule would be like one. Well, it'd be, I, it'd be I, so I so I it'd asked him. I asked him rule. about a month ago. <laughs> we, we were here one morning. It was early and it's dark. I go. I go. Does Deep Marinus have a secret crush on Rule? I think he kind of vibes <laughs> with that Rule. And Matt and and Ravi goes. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I don't. I, I I wouldn't say it's a secret. I just don't. I just don't have the lane for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It's yeah. Not, yeah. Like I'm not. It's not like I'm afraid to announce it publicly or whatever. I just don't think there's much of like from a social media presence standpoint, which is a different conversation than when you're having it in real life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I'm not me going out of my way to like tweet something that I liked from rules, whatever of the day doesn't really register with the audience that I've cultivated on Twitter, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just wouldn't, it just wouldn't hit with the audience. You know what I'm saying? So there's not really a point to me like pontificating about certain things, but I do think it's I, interesting that they share some traits that I think you like. 
No, one hundred percent. And I, I, and I, that's why I like hit you guys up because I know that you guys will, you guys can understand where I'm coming from on both sides of that, right? Yeah. Because uh, you know the subjects of the Creighton side of it with Flan Booth, um, uh, Mac, and all those guys. Uh, I just the biggest appeal is just I'm trying to think about how to put this simply for like radio time wave. Um, he's genuine, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of coaches that you come across and that I've come across in all sorts of sports, in all sorts of settings, that you can just tell the competitive switch doesn't shut off and that it's the main driving force. And I'm not saying that the people I'm talking about in this instance don't, don't possess that chip to an nth degree, because they certainly do. They wouldn't be as good as what they do. It wouldn't be as good as what they do if they didn't have it. But the primary thing is that they care about the people around them mm. first and foremost. Mm. And that the journey with those people doesn't begin and end with a practice or a game or a, or a small window in time in terms of a college career. You know what I mean? It, it extends beyond that. Like They're invested in these people's lives from basically – what sophomore junior year of high school yeah like 15 on cases, yeah yeah in volleyball cases even earlier than that like 13 like, which is which exactly. is why vo- volleyball almost never misses i mean they've done their due diligence exactly. <laughs> for a decade yeah that's always weird to me how early they get their they get their recruiting going um but like and then you and then it then once the careers are over in terms of their college careers um it extends beyond that so i mean it's just i, I it that's the most impressive thing when you come across a leader of individuals, especially young individuals that you can truly resonate with how much they actually care about the development of those people at a, at a formative age. You know what I mean? So Mm. that's the biggest thing that hits with rule with me and why, (laughs) why I really feel for him for what he has to deal with, because I, I haven't made it a secret with you guys. Like I just don't think, the media climate he's in, especially in Lincoln, is conducive to his style of um, transparency in that regard yeah. because results are so paramount in this, mm. you know, just with Nebraska football in general and the and kind of like chasing their past and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I feel for him, but I resonate with a lot of the things he says because it hits, it hits home with uh, – the type of people I'm around on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. It's Matt DeMarius from the White and Blue Review. Matty, uh, when you're uh, when you're looking at let's let's just go to the men's basketball first here for Creighton. When you're looking at the way Coach Mack has constructed this roster, this is kind of an unusual one based on how they've done recently, right? The last couple impressive classes would go or impressive kind of runs would go. Hey. You start them off as freshmen, you bring them up for a couple years, they have a really nice run towards the end of their career, you start over the next time around. He's kind of brought in some guys, I don't want to call them mercenaries, but guys that have kind of plugged holes. Stop stop gaps. Yeah, stop gaps, that's a good word for it. He's brought in some stop gaps while he waits for a Larry Johnson or a Jackson McAndrew or whoever to be ready. Is how How do you kind of weigh how you think this is going to go when we probably haven't seen this since Maurice Watson and Cole Huff? That's an interesting question. I don't know if I've thought about it from that point of view. Because I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't see – I've seen these type of players before, I guess. I, um, I, think, I think from the standpoint of what this year presents, and I understand, and I've certainly heard, you know, the whole, like, recruiting over young players and not really giving them the runway right away that, like, two years or three years ago got with Nemhard, Kaluma, and Trey and those guys. Um, they kind of got thrown to the fire because they were the top guys even um, on that team. I think this year with, with Kaufman back, with Ashworth back, I think you owe – the veterans that have invested time in the program. And funny, certainly this is more true for Kaufman and the Ashworth, but mm. I think you owe that guy, especially the 
opportunity to have the best chance now to just finish it off as best as we can. So I think that's that's where where the stopgap approach makes a lot of sense. Where it's interesting is they're not the type of statistical stopgaps you've normally seen, right? Like Pop Isaac is coming off of the year where he didn't shoot the ball well out of the back court. So that's interesting because is he more of the 38% shooter and he was a freshman? Or is he more of the 28% shooter that we saw last year? Or is it in between? Because if it's either in between or last year, that's probably not uh, going to elevate Creighton's ceiling to the point where it was maybe last year. Mm. But if it's to, more towards where he is, was it the freshman shooting the ball? Um, that could be pretty interesting. Oh. And then Jemiah Neal has never really had a season where you're like, oh, yeah, that guy's knocked down. But, you know, Creighton saw some things in evaluation in terms of maybe where he can be effective in that regard in their system versus Arizona State, which is like never really, you never really understand what they're doing offensively. So it's a different type of system. Defensively, it's different uh, for both of those guys. So it's a transition. And I also think there's a playmaking component with Pop that Creighton is hoping to unlock and cer- certainly the transition phase of their offense. And I think that makes this year interesting. I don't know I don't know how it'll look at the start of things, and I certainly don't think it's going to come without its ups and downs. But the idea of those two and what they can possibly present maybe in March is interesting. If they can fit into the system properly offensively, you know, kind of get a good feel for what is a good shot and what is not a good shot in Creighton's offense and Creighton's system. And if they can just get comfortable with the guys around them and vice versa in terms of, like, sharing the ball, playmaking, playing off one another, um, I think it could be a pretty interesting team because I think they bring, you know, just a lot of speed and tenacity and a certain skill set that seems untapped at the moment that could uh, accentuate what, you know, what Ryan Kaufman's strengths are. I think that's, that's, that's an appeal from a staff standpoint when you're looking at how they evaluate them. Hey, Matty, for you, how important is it in the grand scheme of things that they get some clarity on what they, what is going to happen with Fedor? Pretty huge, pretty massive. Yeah, um, it's, it's the way it seems. He, yeah, he, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see him yet, but uh, yeah, he's got the goods. Um, they just don't so, get guys like he, um, mature, experienced, yeah. good shooter, good size. Like, I mean, seems kind of critical. Yeah, he's, I mean, he, in terms of what you're thinking about, like, what could Creighton possibly do this year, you know, which is always the question, you know, you get asked the most. He's pretty important to where that ceiling actually lands and even how high the floor can get, honestly, because you just the shooting is the first thing that you're like, you know, when, when he starts ripping a few, and you're like, oh, boy, um, that looks fluid, that looks repeatable. Um, that looks interesting. But there's also a playmaking component, just like an understanding of the game from an acumen standpoint that's really interesting. And then you see, like, oh, he can, you know, do this with his left hand, do that with his right hand. Like, there's some versatility there in terms of, like, reading the defense and seeing what they're trying to take away from him and going to the counter. Um, how, many, seen, how, many, how many cases has the NCAA seen like this where, you know, he's obviously the late withdrawal from the draft, but I mean, he's been paid before. You can kind of do that now. It's could boil down to semantics. Like, what's how, the difference between what's getting the, paid from what, an NIL? How will they a... discern between the difference? Yeah, well, a lot more recently, and certainly a lot this year. <laughs> so there's either going to be a blanket decision, or they're going to get really, or it's going to get really messy. You know what I mean? Because when you start, when you start, if you grant one, then there's going to be semantics with the other, and then it's just you know. It all depends on if the NCAA wants to lose another court case or if they want to just say throw their hands up and say, you know what, do whatever you want. We see that we see where college sports is going, you know, and you know having a paycheck in the past isn't the worst thing in the world. So, um, yeah, I think I think from everybody I've talked to, there's a confidence level there that it'll happen at some point in terms of his eligibility. Um, and it's just because it's just like there's just so many players who are 
in that in that, under that umbrella now. Like there's the, Creighton's not the only team waiting on a Fedor Zubic. Um, I mean, he he might be at a high end of what that talent pool looks like, but um, yeah, there's there's going to be a mass decision at some point with these guys because Creighton wasn't the only one who jumped into the international pool for a season uh, for a season you know professional level player this year. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when that decision comes down. If the NCAA wants to fight it, they they're kind of like a war torn fighter at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've just been taking beatings left and right, and you're kind of looking at them funny. Like, do you want to retire? Or do you want to keep going? And, you know, it'll it'll be interesting to see what battle they choose, what battle plan they choose for that one. Uh, I'm only doing this because of my affinity for one guy and and Ravi's former displeasure for another. Who's more important? Who of the two? Who is it more important that they're better? than the last time we saw them play meaningful basketball to create success. Jason Green or Pops Isaac? You said Pop Isaac? Pop Isaac, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, considering Robbie's a fan, and I love Jason Green, so I figured let's, yeah. let's pit one against the other. How dare you? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's you know why I asked the question, though, right? I, mean, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%. There's, there's. There's an interesting, versatile skill set there with both of those guys, potentially. You know, it's interesting because I thought, I, I think, I think that given what this team's strengths are and weaknesses are on paper, that Isaac Trout maybe should be in that group as well. He, he looks fantastic. Doesn't he? Oh. Yeah. I mean, Jeremy Anderson told me he's lost about 15, 15 guess, plus pounds. I guess 20. You know, yeah, he, he looks yeah, amazing. Yeah, he's 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 really committed to kind of being that stretch four who can shoot off the move more than he has shown. You know mm. what I mean? And uh, been one of the better shooters, right? This this yeah. getting into the regular season. Okay, it's, it's what I hear. Yeah, so I, I mean, I watched them scrimmage a couple of weeks ago, and it, you know he was on the second unit because Jason was still, um, Jason was still good uh, from a health standpoint, and. Yeah, Isaac came out ripping. I think he hit three threes in like maybe a hundred seconds and buried the buried the first unit quick. Um, it was like ten nothing fast. And there were different types of threes. They weren't just like standing in the corner, wait for the ball. You know, he was shooting off a move. You know, he was coming to get it. Um, you know, it was pick and pop. Like it was just kind of all the ways you think a four man can stretch the floor. He, he kind of showed it off. So it was really interesting. And then I think that's translated, you know, throughout camp so far. Um, if you want to call it that. So he's interesting. But back to your question. Um, I kind of feel like it might be – I'm not saying Pop's not, like, paramount, but I think I think there are maybe are options there where if it doesn't necessarily yeah. work right away or at all that, you know, they have, like, a Ty Davis who can do some things. They've got Larry Johnson who can do some things. Like, they certainly knocked his looks solid. Like, they have guys they can give – chances if if you know the pop experiment doesn't um doesn't hit right away with jason though there's so much versatility there front court wise and that you know he can maybe guard fives he can guard threes like that so you're basically looking at pre-positional versatility um his rebounding i think is at a higher level than most on the team so he's in a category there by himself kind of i just think he does things that this team can't doesn't really have a lot of options to replace. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at his defensive versatility, um, the way he's been shooting the ball in training, not necessarily. I don't know if it's translated yet live stuff as much, but the shot looks good, and he's worked a lot on it. So if that hits, you know, once the season starts, it wouldn't shock me. Um, I just think there's a lot. There's a lot of skill there that when you look at his size and frame and athleticism. Um, and just like his tenacity too, like he wants to be good, and that's a, that's a big key for a lot of players. You know what I mean? It's one thing when you think you're good, um, but you train that way, and it's another thing when you don't think you're that good and you don't put in the time. Like he wants to be really good, and yep. he thinks he's going to be really good. So mm. that's kind of an interesting light bulb moment for young players. So I think Jason is probably the answer to the question. It's a good answer, Matt. Um, <laughs> want to go? <laughs> <such a hater. laughs> want to go back? To, well, Miller North guy, you know. <laughs> Uh, I want to go back to something you said about Fedor here. 
uh, a minute ago. You said that he can pretty dramatically change the ceiling of this team. Like, just you don't have to give me like a win total or something, but kind of when you're looking at it, what do you mean when you say that? It, like, what's the ceiling without him? What's the ceiling with him in your mind? Well, if, if Ryan Kaufman has the season I think he's going to have, I don't think there is. Like, I think I think you can dream as big as you want to dream. Yeah, he's going to be a problem. With or without Fader think, or both? Well, I think he's – no, he's already a problem without Fader. Let's be, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, um, he's, he's going to be a like problem. Like, I've, I've, said, I've said some crazy stuff that's getting me in trouble. <laughs> uh, leading, into this, <laughs> leading into this year, I'm not backing off. Uh, well, he actually knows he's really good this year. He's exactly who I yeah. thought of when you said there's a difference between kind of being good and knowing you're good. Mm. and Like, he knows he's really good, finally, and I think you're good. He's going to take control. He he I, I, He's going to be a monster. It's so weird that in, a year, that in year five you can sound a whole lot different, like, just in terms of the confidence you exude from a year four. You know what I mean? Because you figure, like, yeah, you, who yeah, you are. It's going to be who you are, like, yeah. Yeah, like I, I think by the time like they get to the end of their sophomore seasons, you pretty much like get a good feel for who they are as a player and who they're going to be, you know what I mean? There isn't a whole lot of change in that next two years, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But Kaufman is different. I mean, I think I think there was a com- – like last year there was a lot of deferment happening just because Baylor mm-hmm. and Trey were so good and they have such dominant personalities basketball-wise, you know what I mean? Like – with the ball in their hands, they can do so many things with how they create for themselves and others, you know, that it was kind of easy to get, to take a back seat, get lost in the sauce, just, you know, be the defensive anchor and then, you know, finish when the ball hits your hands, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm expecting more of like a dominating presence from Carl Spender this year because, you know, he focused a lot on his body in the offseason. He got a full offseason to train, you know, with the the only time he's ever had this situation where he's just been in the gym focusing on getting better for the next season was the jump he made from freshman to sophomore year when he became, you know, he went from 15 minutes a game to 50 minutes a player of the year. So that, that, there's like an intrigue there with like, okay, what is the next jump that that's been? And so far what I've seen is like, I expect him to be a national player of the year type of conversation all season because of how good he looks right now. So um, it'll be a... All, all depends on if they remember he's on the floor or not. Sometimes they forget he's on the floor. So this, this year's team doesn't have that luxury. They have to get the ball, and they have to establish his presence early and often. So that's, um, yeah, it's interesting. That's our guy, Matty DeMarius from the White and Blue Review. Matt, thanks for stepping into my judgment-free zone here, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Matty. Always a pleasure, fellas. <laughs> More Herd Sports Radio coming up next. We're back here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, SDB. I'm Robbie Lula. We're joined now by Dr. Todd Kays of the Kays Concussion Institute right here in Omaha. Dr. Kays, how are you this morning? I'm doing well. How are you all? We're good, good, Doc. We're just, just kind of playing some clippets. We've been processing through this the last couple of weeks. and you know, Coaching high school football, I thought this may have kind of been in the rearview mirror. There was this heightened sense of awareness you know, 10, 11 years ago, it, it, it seems like the game is getting safer. Let's just start with the basics. When you hear concussions and it, it's your area of expertise, educate us on, on what exactly a concussion is. Yeah, the lot has changed, as you said, in the last 10 to 12 years. And what's encouraging is that we're seeing more and more research that's coming out about concussion. And so really our understanding of the injury Uh, is getting more sophisticated by the year. And what we know about concussion in its simplest form is it's really a network disruption injury, and that kind of has several implications. So if it's a disruption, it means that it's a mild injury. And if it's a a network disruption, it means that there's several networks in the brain Mm. that are involved. And if we understand what those networks are, then we can objectively measure it. And if we can objectively measure it, then we can objectively treat it as well. So, Dr. Kays, one of my biggest questions, whether it's, you know, with Tua specifically or with other guys, because you hear all the time these guys say, oh, man, I felt great a day or two after the initial hit. How long do you see typically 
kind of symptoms last versus that network disruption you're talking about last in these concussion cases? Yeah, when you're talking about symptoms, we, we have to understand that in the past, our, there was a heavy reliance on self-reporting of symptoms. And, and the challenge with relying on self-reporting of symptoms is I always give the example of, you know, if, if you went to a conference and you were up super late, and then the next morning you have to get up really early and, and you know, you don't drink a cup of coffee and I give you a symptom checklist, very few of us would be at zero symptoms. And yet that in the past is really what's been driving the decisions that we make from a clinical standpoint. And so as far as uh, symptoms lasting and, and the network's disrupted, it is kind of on an individual case, but they usually do go hand in hand. And one of the challenges is that really the, the more a person is well conditioned, as long as they kind of continue to engage in the physical activity that they're used to while minimizing the risk of hitting their head, the likelihood that they'll recover um, quickly is higher and then they actually recover faster as a result. And so that's why you do see a lot of times these pro athletes rebound fairly quickly just because, uh, you know, their ability to heal and recover is so much higher because they are so well conditioned. And from a kind of scientific standpoint, you know, our autonomic system is what helps us to regulate most of our body functions. And what's less appreciated is it helps us to kind of return back to balance or homeostasis. Interesting. So, Dr. Kays, when you, so how do you, and, and you're the expert, so I'm always curious to see how you process feedbacks from all your variables, i.e. patients. Right, so you hear how fine a line is it between being dismissive or coming across as dismissive of potential dangers and risks versus when you just feel like that's the response you get when people feel like they've been handicapped with all the facts, right? Because R Ravi, we were going back and forth th over the week, and it's like, well, he seems so dismissive mm -hmm. about the out potential outcomes, and I'm like, or maybe he feels he's so educated that he understands the outcomes. How fine a line is that? That's a great question that I believe most people really don't consider. And what I would say is that education is paramount in making informed decisions. Uh, all of us take on risk, as you were saying just before, uh, I hopped on and that level of risk is obviously heightened when you're playing contact sports and you have to have informed information about what are those risks that are involved. I would say the line really is that more times than not, people have too little information or they have mm. incorrect information about this injury. And in my experience, when you're able to really break down and articulate for patients what this injury is, what those networks are that are impacted, why they're having the symptoms that they're having, why we're going to approach the, the treatment and the rehab in the particular way that we are, um, and what are the clear objective findings that we're looking for in order to clear them. People have a lot more confidence in what's going on, and it kind of helps to dismiss um, or demystify, I should say, the magic number uh, of concussions uh, myth that's going around as far as you know, huh. if, you, if you receive a certain amount of concussions, then, then you're out. Interesting. So, so Dr. Kays, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's sort of, I think, the thing that bothers me is kind of the multiple concussion cases, right? Where I, I guess, what does the data tell you both about kind of the risk of another concussion kind of once you've had one or have had multiple? And then what is, how does that change your long-term outlook when you're getting these kind of multiple concussion cases? Yeah, so what we know is that what's interesting is that when we look at giant, giant data sets, we know that in the early phases, we were actually not that great at treating concussions and we were returning athletes too soon. And, and the way that we know that is that within six months of after returning them, sometimes we would see as high as 30% of them getting re-injured. Mm. And then as we started to learn more and have more specific protocols and targeted treatment, we started to see in data that the risk of re-injury or the actual incident of re-injury 
started to be less than 3%, so basically less than huh. a chance. And so we're getting much more um, specific in what we're doing and, and much more uh, objective, and so we can have confidence of when we return somebody, you know, they're they're in really good shape. So there's that portion. And then as far as the, the long-term effects, you're really getting at what is often referred to uh, is as CTE. And mm-hmm. the challenge with, with CTE and, and the misinformation out there is that there's actually more articles in the New York Times about CTE than actual confirmed cases. And so huh. you know, I'm not saying that there's not something to CTE. There is some thoughtful research out there. But we definitely have to learn a lot more. And, and people who are stating that, it, it, it's a known phenomena. It's something that can be diagnosed um, while someone's living. That, that's just not supported by the research. And every once in a while, we do have to talk to athletes about, is it time to consider medical retirement? And I would say that that's extremely aware. Like maybe, uh, in my experience, one out of every 2,000 cases, I'm, I'm having to have that conversation and what you're looking at is hmm. when the person gets injured, is it taking less to cause the injury? In the acute phases of the injury, are they, uh, you know, is it more intense as far as the symptoms and their, their response to rehab? Are they taking longer to recover? And, you know, the one person that we had to have a conversation about retiring, it, it was literally every time we sent them out there within a week there, they're getting injured, even though we were comprehensive and, and we knew that they were, were fully healed. And it was uh, finally just time to say, you know what, I, I don't think your, your brain is um, set up to be handling playing contact sports. Mm-hmm. We've only got about 60 seconds here, Doc, and I hear risk mitigation a ton, right, with guardian caps and things like that. And, but I understand full well that, you know, risk mitigation means to like to lessen the negative impacts is there such a thing as risk mitigation when it comes to concussion protocol? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that there is. That's a good question. You know, some of the, the technologies that are um, highly publicized, I would say uh, we're still learning from a research standpoint. What we do know uh, is that there is some research that supports consistently wearing a mouth guard, wearing a helmet that fits. Uh, and uh, neck strength can, can prevent stuff. Yeah. But really the more important piece is that, you know, we have to embrace this is going to be an injury, and we really need to be promoting specialized treatment and, and getting to a specialist as early as possible to to mitigate those risks after injury. Mm. Mm. That's Dr. Case from the Fantastic Case Concussion stuff, Dr. Institute. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Doc. It's Dr. Case from the Case Concussion. I feel better. That's interesting. I feel better. I, I, now it just sparks more thought. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously there's still some concerns, but I feel better than I did. Okay. Might right. be able to let the, the Hawk Tua thing go. <laughs> let it ride right on down the river. <laughs> <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. We try to inform. That's DB. I'm Rob. We'll be back with Brian Edwards, our Vegas insider, coming up next. Wrapping up hour number two here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're joined now by our friend Brian Edwards, our Vegas insider from Major Wager. B. Edwards, what's going on, bud? Oh, we don't, we don't have the headphones <laughs> on. We're <laughs> muted. Oh, no. You're a mess, B. What's going on? Oh, no. He doesn't have his glasses on. <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> This is a this is a disaster. All right, click that little button for me, B. We still can't hear you. Click that mute button. <laughs> wow, <laughs> what is going on? Oh, he Brian, Brian, we we can't hear you, buddy. I think you've muted yourself. He can't find it. He's working on the button. We may have to call him again, Shane. No, he's he's got it. I got faith in him. I don't I don't think he's got it. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> it doesn't seem like he's got he, it. He looks confident. <laughs> he looks confused. <laughs> no, he's laughing at us because we're basically commentating this whole debacle. I don't really love it. <laughs> oh, I got excited. I thought no. it was bad. Oh, no? Yeah. No, there it is. We just had him. I, I did not have myself muted over here. I don't there, know what there was There we on. go. What in the world all is right. that all Sorry. about? Did we surprise you that you were on this morning or what? I promise it wasn't my little button over here. It was muting me down here. I don't know what the hell. Anyway, let's go. I think Shane might be sabotaging you. I think he might be muting your channel. 
He just he's wanting to Damon to get a few laughs. Yeah, no. So he, I think he wants to make me mad because he knows I'd rather have you on stream. <laughs> so if it brings me joy, he doesn't want it to happen. So he sabotages the whole thing. I got so it. Has, I got it. So he has to say, "Oh, we just have to do him on the phone." <laughs> I'm, I'm Sugar still, Shane. I'm still mad at you, B, for your Indiana play last week. Okay, so let's not do uh, that uh, uh, th- again. Okay, can we not do that? Oh uh, man, and <laughs> I would have never thought that happened with Rourke getting hurt. Uh, but man, I, I, I the, the okay. So I kind of tuned that game out. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Me, me too. But I was actually broadcasting. <laughs> right, right. I think because, a lot of people because he got me. the big lead. <laughs> But no, this is a legit question. So I'm uh, like, so the the backup looked good because I I wasn't watching yeah, in the second half. Yeah. Like, so it's a very it's a very similar offense. He you know they they do what they do, and uh, he he ran it well. Okay. He okay, arguably so threw I he like, arguably threw the best pass of the day, and there were some dimes. Yeah. <laughs> there were probably about six or seven. Okay, candidates. so. So, I mean, I looked at his stats from last year. They were not very good, but obviously it's Signetti now, and his stats look great last week. So, I mean, I kind of want to play in the end again this week. I mean, do you think it's not that big of a, a drop-off from Rourke? I, I wish – it's a it's a drop-off in terms of maybe over time is passing accuracy, but the offense will look exactly the same. They're not – they're, they're, the, I'm sorry. He's a better he runner. give them a little more of a runner? Is that, okay, yep, he's, he's a significantly better runner yeah. than Rourke. Okay. I don't know if he, All right, I think – I, all right, well, I think I'm going to add Indiana to my list as well. Well, the funny thing is, is Washington is so fickle. Yeah. Like what? Like I don't even know who Washington is when they're actually trying to score points and not play the analytics game. They can move the ball. And it's their third trip east since September 28th. They went at Rutgers, then Michigan at home, then at Iowa. Uh, they have had two weeks to prepare, though. All right, let's get right to it. Q's uh, getting five and a half. I, I wish I knew more about Pitt. I kind of like this one, but I kind of like the number. I think Pitt, what'd you make the number, first of all? Mm. Um, yeah, hold on one sec. Uh, all right, here we go. ACC. Uh, I made Pitt four. Okay. Okay. Yes. And it's up to so, six. Right, right. Um, uh, last look, there were a few sixes left. It was mostly five and a half, but if you consider six a key number like me, you can buy the half point. Now, I'm a little concerned. Uh, Tra- Trebor Pena, their leading pass catcher, is doubtful. Um, so, you know, a one less weapon for McCord. Uh, and Pitt was a team that's been good to me this year, but they were my top pick two weeks ago when they did not get the cover against Cal. We're, we're fortunate uh, to win. And, I mean, look, Syracuse, uh, they have back-to-back road wins at UNLV, which I think is a good team. And then after going out west, they had to go to NC State. Now, it was a, a Friday game out west, so they had an extra day, but that's still a pretty brutal spot going out west, back to Syracuse and down to NC State, but they still win and cover again. And now they've had two weeks, even though it's a third straight road game. Um, you know, they did have a week off. And McCord, you know, he's been fantastic this year 65.6% uh, percent completion percentage, 2,160 passing yards, 19 to 6 TDI and T ratio. I like LaQuint Allen, uh, their running back. And I just think these are two pretty equal teams. And I, I think we're going to have a close game. So give me the underdog. Yeah, we'll get to see little UNLV tomorrow night against Boise. That's quietly a very good game. It gets yes. no burn on my television with the Dodgers tomorrow night, but that's going to be a good game. Go ahead, bro. Be uh, kind of the darling of the SEC, Vandy, plus 19 against Texas. How you feeling Did there? Did you call them the darling of the SEC? I did, yeah. <laughs> I sensed uh, whatever tone was implied there as well. I made Texas 14. I, the covering machine <laughs> on the Vandy. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm Team Pavio over here. We're, we're fans. Oh, hey, one, one of my best friends, his, his son plays for Vandy here locally, so we're all we're all in on Vandy here. Go Commodore. Yeah, man. Who, 
who doesn't like Diego Pavia? And uh, so Vandy, <laughs> I made Texas 14. Um, Vandy's been a double-digit underdog four times this year, 4-0 against the spread, three outright wins, only lost by three in overtime at Missouri. Uh, Pavia, 11-1 TDI and T ratio, team best, 470 rushing yards, three touchdowns. And Vandy's defense is a lot better, number 38 nationally against the run, number 40 and total defense, and I just think it's a letdown situation for Texas after playing its arch rival, uh, or, uh, Oklahoma, two weeks ago, and then Georgia uh, last week. And look, I mean, Texas, you know, now that we're halfway through the season, the win at Michigan has not aged well. And, it, you know, with Oklahoma missing all those receivers and being down – I mean, it really looks like Georgia's the only team of significance they've played, and they got thumped at home. So, I mean, I'm not saying it, it, Vandy's going to win outright, but um, I, I did grab a little bit of a plus six one or some excuse me plus six twenty money line. But the main play is Vandy plus the eighteen and a half. Just a little taste. Just a little taste. Just a little taste. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case right, Diego Magic strikes again. <laughs> yeah, I I, t- I keep telling you, I've got some funny stories about Pavia. Uh, let's go now. I like this pick for you, and I don't know about the side necessarily, but I do know you know Cincinnati. You watch the, you seem to know quite a bit about them, and that you like the fact that they're catching a pretty good number. Yeah, and I like, I mean, I like Colorado as well. These are two of the biggest surprises in the country, both playing outstanding uh, right now, and. Um, like I've said before on previous shows, Cincinnati's is this close to being undefeated. I mean, they had a 27 to 10 lead with less than a minute left in the third quarter against Pitt and Pitt rallied for a 28, 27 win. And then they lost 44 to 41 at Texas tech when um, they missed two field goals and Sorsby had like either 11 or 12 touchdown passes without an interception. And they were driving uh, in the like early mid ish third quarter. And uh, he threw a pick six so that was a bit like a 60-yard pick six. So it was like a big swing. Um, and, and yet they still only lost by three. And that went down as a push for them on the closing line. But I had them plus four early in the week. So they've won four of their last five or 4 and one against the spread or 5-0 and against the spread, however, whenever you got the line. And Sorsby's been great for them at quarterback. 67.2 completion percentage, 1,928 passing yards, 13-4, to TDI and T ratio, and six rushing touchdowns. And I love their running back, Corey Kiner. And I think it's a toss-up game. Give me Cincy plus five or five and a half. Mm. B, your two favorite teams in the country playing this weekend, Miami and Florida State. Uh, how, <laughs> many, how, how many different ways can you bet against the Seminoles? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, man, I I mean, I, I, I put a little oh, – I'm going to quit doing this. I've done it like four times in this interview. <laughs> but uh, I put a little on Miami minus 21, but I like the team total over 37 and a half, much better. So they have scored 41, 56, 62, 50, 38, 39, and 52. So they've been over 37 and a half every single time. Now, I will – FSU has only given up more than – Heck, they've only given up more than 29 once. That was 42 to SMU. But I'm on a um, – I'm still going to do it. Uh, Miami over – team total over 37 and a half. All right, less than a key number, two and a half at home. They appear to be pretty equal teams. I'm always afraid. But A&M laying the two and a half. Yeah, um, the home team usually dominates this series. And I just uh, – being less than three – I mean, I, I, I like both these teams. It's wild to me that, that LSU's won all these games in a row because they could have lost a couple they don't of even them. But pa- they don't even pass the eye test. They're, yeah, outside, they really don't. Outside of Penn State, they're the hardest team for me to kind of break down that's in the top ten. Yep. I, I, I agree. And I lost going against them last week with Arkansas. I didn't play the Ole Miss game. Heck, I went against them with South Alabama. But I went against them against South Carolina and won. So I'm one and two in their game. So I haven't been very good with LSU, but but I think A&M's on, I mean, they're both on fire. They both uh, won since losing in week one, but A&M at home, less than three. I got to go Aggies. B, you hopping on that Billy Napier bandwagon yet? No, sir. And (laughs) the, 
the uh, scuttlebutt, if you will, of him being retained maybe is not going to happen, and it's driving me nuts. Well, I mean, there's like five games left that are against like sure. top ten teams, so I feel <laughs> sure. like you're going to have plenty of opportunities to uh, make your decision on Billy Napier. B, we appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you next week. All right, guys. We'll see y'all. Thanks. Kicking off hour number three here on Herd at Sports Radio AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're joined now by Michael Brunts of Husker 24-7. What's up, Brunts? How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm good. Well, that's a... You sound subdued. You okay, Bruncey? Or are you, you, are you, uh, are you fatigue? Are you Indiana, what happened, psychoanalyzing fatigue? Or is it just a basic school drop-off? What's going on, Bruncey? Uh, kind of like combination of everything. Um, <laughs> I think that here's what happened. Um, so I don't know if you guys ever experienced this, but there's nothing worse where like you don't get enough sleep and you, you wake up and there's like enough coffee in, in the, in the little, uh, container to do like a third of a, a third of a pot of coffee. Mm. Right. So do you, do you just, do you accept that you're not going to drink that much or do you go and just make church coffee? Those are your two choices. And, uh, neither of them are good. I, I and, and with drop off, I haven't had time to hit a drive through. So I'm going to, I'm going to grit through it here, guys. Sorry. That was as close. I'll perk, I'll perk up. I'll say you're gutty. I appreciate it. That, that was as close as you and I have ever watched a game together, merely separated by a couple of milli inches of glass. Not yeah. that you were paying attention to me and my poor body language, <laughs> but at what point were you like, uh, I don't need to see this. I can go ahead and start writing. Uh, I'm trying to think. It was at least past halftime, right? I felt oh, I got, I got a little, I got a, I got a great pep talk from Foreman at the half and as you know, when I almost fell down the stairs again for the sixth time, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to get it together. <laughs> <laughs> I, ex- I have expected to, like, not not you, but, like, somebody to be, like, hanging on to that railing <laughs> like like they were, like, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone and Cliffhanger. Like, that, it was that kind of a situation. Um, but, yeah, no. I, Our I, third I, movie I, reference of the week, and it was all – both the, it was twenty four seven sports guys. I mean, do you guys love movies? <laughs> I mean, I I, I appreciate a, a deep cut on a reference like that. So, um, no, I my body language was terrible. It was probably terrible by about two minutes at, at the two minute timeout. We're not calling it the warning. Um, yeah. At the, at the two minute timeout, I probably had the glasses off and rubbing the temple a little bit. <laughs> Uh, Brunts, as we, uh, as we try and close the chapter on Indiana a little bit here, I slam that bad boy shut. (laughs) Is there, when you, when you look back at it as, you know, somebody that does what we do, are you, are you making, are you having any takeaways from that? Or you just say, Hey, they didn't show up. They didn't play well. Let's move on. Both. I mean, I, I think it's both like, some of the some of the offensive issues were not unique to the Indiana game. Sure. I mean, you know, three three out of the last four weeks they've they've failed to get to a hundred yards rushing. Um, you know, they're they're averaging I think it's two point seven six a carry in Big Ten play right now. Um, I only I, I I don't have that committed to memory. I I, I wrote that this morning, so um, <laughs> just just to clarify. <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, I, I think, I think there were things that like, it's, it's different sides of the ball, right? Like, I think, I think offense, you you can see that kind of being the culmination of issues that, that were kind of lurking beneath the surface in previous weeks. And, you know, I think defensively, I'm a little bit more willing to excuse it as a, as a one-off, although, you know, the, the concern, I guess, is, is it's kind of like a it's like a golfer that, you know, is, is generally pretty consistent and, play, you know, plays the game well, can get around the course, knows what they're doing. But 
but they they have that ability on a bad day to you know you're you're a six handicap and you shoot 92 like i mean the, it, it's that kind of a a thing and you know I, I think nebraska for the most part last year limited those the, limited the 92s and and uh you know I, I think that's probably the one concern was you know you, man that was that was just uh that was not good but I, I think that the track record on that side of the ball allows me to say it's a little bit more more in the one-off category than, um, you know, giant concerns about what was going on. Yeah, so, Brent, the kind of the low-hanging – it's not low – I don't want to call it low-hanging fruit. The, the, the easy question is, okay, so, hey, what does progress look like, right? And players hate that. And coaches hate that. It, it's usually just stuff we talk about. But when you look at the way Nebraska needs to play, how much of it is independent of what Ohio State is doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, – you, you mean going into this week? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think it's – I think the, I think a lot of how that Ohio State game is going to go is going to be dependent on how Nebraska shows up, and you know what what they're able to find that that's consistent. And I'm I'm speaking mainly offensively here. Um, you know I, I think I I think Nebraska needs to find something that kind of kind of drill down a little bit and get a little bit more focused on these these are three or four things that we want to do well and you know kind of kind of find your mojo a little bit around you know maybe a little bit more streamlined approach um because i mean you know ohio state's going to be ohio state they've got athletes all over the place um you know that they are going to be i think pretty ticked off and, and ready to make a point in that game based on how their previous game went. And so, you know, I, I think Nebraska needs to, to kind of warm to the fight pretty quickly. Cause I, I, I mean, Damon, I don't know about you, but it didn't feel like to me that there was a ton of juice on the Nebraska side before that game against Indiana. Like, yeah. like I, I think you have to, I, I, you can't be awed by, the 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 uniform that's on the other side of the line of scrimmage, but you also need to walk into that game, you know, ready to throw some uh, some, some metaphorical punches, and and I don't I don't think Nebraska felt ready to do that against Indiana. So it's it's I think schematically you got to find some things. I think you also kind of have to, to to find that find your edge a little bit more because I it just didn't. Uh, didn't have it coming out of the bye week, and I think that was that was one of the more surprising things was just how flat they were. Nebraska's shaking up the travel roster a little bit in some in some key spots. How much how how fine a line is it? Do you think Bruncey to not panic and scrap what you've done wholesale, but to understand you may need some small interjections here to close out the season, still sitting at five wins. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I, I think there's there's room on that travel roster to do that. And, you know, we all, we have all applauded the James Williams story and and for good reason. And, you know, I think the thing that he kind of gave you last year was that kind of injection of energy, like you said, that, you know, I I think there's a a freshness to it. I mean, it's almost a little bit like, uh, you know, you're, you're making a bit of a line change at times. Um, and, And that's, that's the benefit of depth. I mean, if you're, you're trying to build depth as a program um, and, and you're developing guys, I mean, maybe by the seventh, eighth game of the season, there's, there's something that guys can do that's very specific and give you a little bit of a boost that way. So, um, you know, I mean, Nebraska has got a really deep roster. They feel like they've got a deep roster. And if it's, you know, you're bringing a guy along because he's, uh, you know, he's shown something in coverage on special teams, or there's, uh, you know, a, a series of plays that he runs really, really well that, you know, is a good matchup. I, I think you would, 
you know, be crazy to not try to get any advantage that you can. Mm. Um, so, well, I mean, we'll see what that ultimately looks like. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I, – I would, I would not see a few new names on the travel roster as being like we are, we are completely, you know, resetting the deck at, at the midpoint of the season. Brunt, let's kind of take that line of thinking a little bit further, right? We've heard a lot this week, whether it's about – confidence or whether it's about hey you know a bad things happen we get our heads down a little bit a- at some point if, if that's a pattern that you see with guys do you go further than putting some new names on the travel roster and actually just say hey we've got to go with some guys that don't have that type of baggage yet yeah i think if the if the drop off's not big skill wise i mean i think i think a little bit of edge is, is probably a good thing and i mean this is a game where you know, you, you're probably going to need to be able to uh, <laughs> to be okay with things not going exactly to plan. I mean, I, I think that's just kind of the nature of playing a team like Ohio State. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and the I mean, the thing is, is you know, we talk about the mentality and you know where where guys' feelings are and and things left over from the past regime and the here we go again and all that stuff. I mean, at some point, like it's it's football. Like you gotta like now, like now that that point is now. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, no, I think that point like, was Saturday. See, that's gotta... the, but, <laughs> yeah. but but what you're he and Brunson is around me all the time. So that's the part that bug that bugs me. At some point, you just you just got to fight. You just just play ball, man. Just just yeah. play ball. Yeah, I mean it's. Sure, I'm sure there's some trauma left over from the way that things have played out in the past. But I mean, the way that you get past that is, is by making it not happen and and tackling and getting off blocks and winning one on ones and playing with energy and effort. And I mean, I, I I think that's that's kind of the other side of the coin of of the you know how you, how you're approaching things and how you're. Um, you know, kind of building this thing is, you know, at some point it's, it's blocking and tackling and, it, and it's a very kind of, uh, you know, easy to see the results of that. So, I, I mean, I, I think, I think that's kind of where the point where you're at now too, is like, you're getting into the, into the a really important stretch here. It's November. It's, it's time to, to play some, some man football and uh, not, not worry so much about the feelings and, and everything that's happened in the past. We're talking with Michael Brunts from Husker 24-7. Brunts, do you, and this is kind of a weird question, but like, do you think that's learnable, right? Because I, I sit here and I go, is that a word? Learnable? Is that a thing that you can learn? Uh, because I sit here and I, I think, okay, like it's not just football, right? Like most successful people in life, it's just like it's failure management, a lot of it, right? Like figuring out, okay, this didn't work, what's next? And being able to do that with confidence and without having it kind of shake who you are. Is that in your mind, we're going to say learnable again, is that a learnable skill or, or do you kind of just like some people have it or they don't? Because we know some people don't. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the hope is, is you have more people on your roster that it's learnable for um, than, than not, right? Like, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I, I think some people are just built that way. Like, and, and that's fine. And, and Nebraska probably has quite a few guys on their roster that, that are like that. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think if, if, if it's a question of whether you've got a guy who's, and, and it tends to be younger guys, I feel like sometimes that, you know, if they're built a little bit differently, they're going to get on the field and they're just going to play and, and not, and not worry about all the other stuff and, and just kind of trust your, your athletic ability. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's probably, more learnable if you're if you're able to actually succeed and do that i mean and and it kind of probably compounds on itself a little bit too where Mm -hmm. it's it's easier to learn those things and and kind of make that step as a program when you have you have things that you can lean on when it's when things are are kind of tough you Mm -hmm. know what i mean like if if you're down 10 points like what? What are you going to do offensively that's going to keep you in the game and not seem like it's just panic? You know what I mean? So, I, I think that's that that's where it's kind of tough because it, it's like you're you're trying to get get over that proverbial hump, and you, you just don't know yet. Like what what are you and what can you rely on when it's a little bit challenging? 
Brunts, if if you're uh, Coach Sat, and you know I'm, we're not sure on on Dylan's health situation. We know we've seen him grimace a couple of times. You saw him getting up uh, from the pile and in Bloomington. I don't know if the TV caught it, but clearly something was wrong with the ankle. Is is that a conversation? Do you think you have ahead of time about hey? You know, from a health standpoint, we're going to work you like this, this, and this. We may utilize this package. We won't ask you to do this. Or are you trying to get feedback and saying, if a guy wants to go, then he's going, and you try to do your best to protect him from himself? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you kind of have to have an approach going into the game of, like, with, with these set of circumstances, this is what we're able to do and do well. And it, it's kind of what I what I meant earlier. I mean, I, I think it, it feels like it, things need to be simplified a little bit. I think that would kind of help everybody. Um, just from an execution standpoint, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it, if you drill and drill and drill things that, that you feel like you can do well, it feels like that there's some, some power and simplicity there. But with, with Dylan, I mean, I, I I'm – you know, he's a competitor. He's going to say he's fine, but I think you probably have to, to call things and set things up in a way that is going to, you know, highlight what he's able to do well and maybe not ask him to do things that he's maybe not equipped to do um, given the circumstances. Because yeah, so, real time, I didn't have much of a problem with the way Nebraska was staying aggressive. I felt like that was something that they had to go through and then, you know, you can fix it the next time around you're in it. But I think you at least have to feel what that feels like so you can do all you can to avoid feeling like that again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of just have to wear it, right? Yeah. Like it's <laughs> – yep. you're, you're, you're that guy trying to get another inning in in, in the six to save the bullpen. I mean, it, it kind of sucks, but you kind of you, – you kind of do need to go through that a little bit and – I don't know, especially for Dylan. I mean, I you know he, he's a high achieving guy that that's won everywhere. I mean, this is all it's new to him too. You know. Yeah. We're talking Michael Brunts Husker twenty four seven Brunts as we look at Ohio State. Um, obviously, Nebraska is a big underdog here. Uh, I've heard some people, I won't mention who, but you work with one of them, uh, feel like that Nebraska needs to do some things that are pretty extreme or out of the ordinary to even give themselves a chance to be in this game. Like, do you see a world in which Ohio state's looking ahead or Nebraska comes out with a little piss and vinegar or like, like, is there any world where this is, well, I do hate the assumption that Nebraska is going to be like the lost yeah, puppy like a, dog and yeah. Ohio state's going to be pissed. I mean, I'm, I'm, Nebraska can't be tickled. Yeah. I, I get like Bruns. What does, what does a world in which this is a game in the fourth quarter look like to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if if it's if that's the case, I think Nebraska is going to, you know, defensively, you're probably going to have to have forced a couple turnovers, um, you know, a, a stolen possession here or there. Um, you, you're probably going to have to hit on a few chunk plays, which, I mean, that's Ohio State showed against Oregon. I mean, that, that they're gettable in that way um, with, with the deep passing game. Surprisingly, I mean, I, Burke has really struggled. It wasn't just Oregon either. I, 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 I'm, I'm surprised without the lack of, may, and maybe it is the lack of pass rush, like getting guys to the ground for Ohio State. But Burke's been a better, but he's a better player than he's shown. There, the the conversation this week over over there has been a lot about a disconnect between some of the defensive coaches leading to that issue. Is my is my understanding of it. Um, it, prob- it probably so, started here in Omaha, Nebraska, Brunson. I've been talking about that for about six weeks. <laughs> no, there, I mean, some, I, something is clearly off between Knowles and Johnson Sr. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, that, that's been the topic over there uh, during the bye. So, I mean, there, there's probably something to that. And I don't know. I mean, I, it, it's given the way that the previous games went for both teams, you would hope that, that both are pretty ticked off. I mean, I, I think uh, – you know, from from listening to the Ohio State folks kind of line this game up, I mean, I I, I think they're a little bit uh, they're expecting a really tough game from Nebraska, based on how things went last week, and I, I think uh, 
you know, for Nebraska, like I said, you're going to have to probably get a couple turnovers. You're going to have to be really stout against the run and get off the field when you can. And you're going to need Dylan to, to play like a, you know, a five-star quarterback can. I mean, I think that that's a big key is how do you kind of get back to, to just being more efficient. So you're going to need some, some, uh, some unique plays. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's the challenge is, is how do you get more explosive on offense and, and how do you, uh, you know, make things a little bit more difficult for Ohio state. I mean, they, they, they obviously are going to want to come out and, and, you know, they, they need to start, start, you know, getting some style points here as you start looking towards the end of the season for them. So, uh, they're going to be really willing, I think, to to do whatever they can to make that score look bad for Nebraska. Mm. Bronce, as you look towards the receiving group a little bit this week, do you expect anything different in the rotation there at all? I don't know. It, it kind of depends on what direction Nebraska wants to go. I mean, I I think if you're if you're wanting to do more on the edges, I I would I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit more Alex Bullock in there. Um, in, in specific situations, it, it seems like they're trying to get a little bit more going for Carter Nelson in, in the past game. I'll be eager to see if that's the case. And I mean, it's, you know, I, I feel like we talked about it for a fair amount this season, but I mean, it feels like there's more out there for Jalen Lloyd and a guy with elite speed that, you know, maybe just runs by a guy, I, I, you know, if Ohio state's having that kind of issue. So, um, you know, I, I think for Nebraska, you need to you need to hit on a few of those if you're going to give yourself a chance to to hang in there in the fourth quarter against Ohio State. But I mean, I, I think you know, I, I I I think especially with the issues on the perimeter block, you, you know, you you need to find a few more guys that are are able to do those things because you, you got to have the short, quick game if if you're not gonna, if you're getting two point seven a carry. I mean, that that's just the reality of where you're at. Mm. Runs, what's the in your mind? What's the running back rotation moving forward? If Nebraska is actually like Satterfield said, trying to commit more to the running game, is it try and find a rhythm with a guy, or is it gonna? You think I think it's it might it might be more options in at the same time, or yeah, it's like more op- like more options stuff. Mo- well, no more more guys more guys that in. can carry the ball in the backfield at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I think that's probably the direction. I think, I mean, if you look at kind of where they run the ball, um, you know, pretty much all of their big plays of 10 yards or more uh, in the run game have come, you know, tackles and out and further outside. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think the answer is just, you know, hammering Dowdell straight into the line because um, I, I just don't think you're going to, have a ton of success that way but yeah i mean i i, I think it's going to be a, a little bit wider cast of characters and you know i i think the really important thing and, and when nebraska has run the ball well and it's been in small doses it's matching up the play calling with the personnel because i feel like sometimes that that has not that is not the, the the marriage of things there has not benefited nebraska with the way that some plays are called so um you know, I, I think it's got to be a lot of the stuff to the outside because that's just been – that's where they've had success so far this year. That's Michael Bruns, Husker 24-7. Bruns, we appreciate it. Thanks, Bruns. See you guys. More Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. It's time for Bet On It, brought to you by Warhorse Sportsbook. Make sure you get to the casino in Omaha this weekend on Saturday. You can win $500 of free slot play every half hour between 6 and 10. Then at 10.30, they're going to give away $10,000 cold hard cash to one lucky guest. Make sure you get to warhorsecasino.com for all the details. DB, there are a lot of interesting college games this week as well. Yes, there are. And I am I'm I'm intrigued. I've got I think about 10 here. 10. 10. Yeah. 10 that I'm interested in. First one is that Syracuse pick game tonight. Yeah, I'll take uh I'm going to take I'm going to lay the six. You're going to lay the six? I'll take Pitt. You're, you're taking Pitt here? Yeah. I don't know what to do with Pitt yet. 
Me neither. I really don't. I kind of like Syracuse, though. And I don't know if it's just because McCord's playing so well. It's because or... what you saw them do on the road a couple weeks ago on a weeknight. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. And then you look, oh, look at McCord's numbers. You're like, oh, man, he's kind of tearing it up a little bit. You feel yeah. pretty good about it. Because that was at UNLV, right? Yeah. 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 That, and I and I like. I think UNLV's good. So. And, yeah. I mean, they are good. I'm going to see. So, they're going to, it's three tomorrow night against Boise, right? That one's super interesting, too. Yeah. Just three. Which is uh, also that. Why, why is every kid in the Metro copying Jaunty, Jaunty's stance, though? Because <laughs> they think it's cool, man. Man. Just stand there like a statue. I don't even know how you get going. Because <laughs> every time he takes, you know, I don't know. It works for him, uh, clearly. I think he just is, about anything works for that guy. He is incredible. No, it's all of these group of five games, though, have just gotten super interesting mm-hmm. because of what just happened to Liberty, too. One of the one of the teams that was in probably pole position or close to it. To well, like I said, I wish I I would have I could have said when we went to Kennesaw State, it was to see the football program. <laughs> it wasn't. It was to see the baseball stadium. I don't think anybody goes to Kennesaw State. It was the only, it was program. probably only about, about 15, 20 minutes from where we were. Yeah, yeah. I heard it's a great campus, great baseball it's, facility. It's beautiful. Yeah. Like it's Atlanta Metro, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, great, great place. It's, but it was beautiful. Not what people think of as a football school. Yeah. So these group of five games are getting super interesting. Speaking of which, we've got Notre Dame and my guys. You know, I love a service academy. Notre Dame and Navy this week. Oh, that's a big number. Um, the effusive praise that Navy was giving Notre Dame is incredible. And are they paying to not have this game? Like, is Notre Dame paying to play this game someplace else? I, I'm not. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. Not sure. I'm pretty sure they broke Navy off a check. <laughs> like, hey, let's play here. <laughs> um, let's go. What is it? Fourteen. Uh, twelve. Yeah, I'm checking the update. It's thirteen and a half now. Uh, I will take. God, they historically play it close. Why the big number? I don't know. Notre Dame is in, is really really good defensively they are. right now though. And Riley Leonard's starting to play better. I, I'm gonna. I'll lay the points. I'll take. I'm, I'm not a big faves guy, but I'm two for two right now. I'm a I'm a Navy guy, so yeah. we're taking we're taking the midshipman. Navy diver, stand down. You disregard. <laughs> this is my detail. A Navy a Navy diver is not a fighting man. He is a salvage expert. Just don't don't start calling anybody Cookie. All right. Yeah, and I'm I'm all <laughs> is, the way out. Where is that from? I'm all the way out on Cuba Gooding Jr. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what's that? Robert De Niro, right? Yeah. Oh, that's right. What's the uh, What's the name of that movie? The diver movie. No, it's not called the dive. No, movie. no, but it's the dive. It's the movie it's, about the Navy diver that gets yes, that's yes, hurt, whatever. Yes. Eddie, <laughs> that's a good movie. It's a yeah, it's a real good movie. Good. Uh, next one I've got for my college games this week. Do you care at all about Oklahoma Ole Miss? No. Okay, we'll move on then. Illinois at Oregon. I don't even know who's playing for Oklahoma. Why would you uh, cap that? I'm. I don't know. I didn't <laughs> ask what. I didn't ask what your pick was. Just do you care? <laughs> what's the What's the number? Uh, the number is. Minus twenty for Ole Miss. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't even. I don't, I don't even know who's it. dressing for Oklahoma. Yeah, I really don't know what to do with it. Apparently, Jackson Dart's going to start, though. We know that. Yeah, I don't know what to do with it's Oklahoma your Dart game, right? You all. love some Jackson Dart. I like darts, the game. I do not like Jackson. How Dart, many the people's pens and their balloons burst with that ten win total that everybody was on for Ole Miss to start the season? Ooh, that that's a <laughs> their schedule got a lot harder than people thought it was going to yeah. be. Yeah. Like it looked pretty manageable, and all of a sudden, they're looking at no fun when the rabbits got the gun. One and two in the SEC, yeah. and looking up at a lot of teams, yeah. uh, including Missouri and Alabama. This is kind of like an elimination game. I just almost. don't think Missouri's very good, but I don't know about. Bama. I'll say it's Bama. <laughs> they're so dysfunctional on the sidelines. Yeah, um, minus sixteen and a half, Alabama. Gosh, that's huge. I know. <laughs> um. This sounds dumb, but I'm going to lay it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go. I am think I'm going Missouri here. I'm going. They're oh, not very good. I don't either, but Alabama's dysfunctional. Okay. I, I trust dysfunction less than I trust. I, I usually do, too. I But I'm not. I There's no way. All right. Texas Vanderbilt. Um, it's down to 18 and a half now. I still think the number's right. So you're going Texas? I'm going to take Texas. <laughs> You man, you I know this is incredible. Love big favorites. It's it's incredible. It Just goes, as much as you it's hate man to man defense. It's it's yeah. <laughs> a lot of misnomers. I'm taking all right. I'm I'm taking Vandy at home. Yeah, give do, me Vandy at home. Do, big, your, do your thing. Big Pavia guy. Uh, Penn State, Wisconsin. So what is it? Six and a half. Six and a half. At Camp Randall. 
I really, I know you don't love Penn State. I don't at all, but I really need them to win this game. And Wisconsin's playing better. Yeah. Um, Although, you know, competition, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm going to take the Nanny Lions on the road. This one's this one's tough. No, it, I, it is. I don't want to. I, I don't want to just be the dog guy. I think uh, I go Wisconsin here. I, I could. This feels pretend, like a hiccup for me. This feels like I could go over. Yes, <laughs> because I while I'm not super worried about Ohio State looking ahead, I maybe am a little worried about Penn State looking ahead. Yeah, uh, I like I like Penn State because this this Ohio State game is kind of their whole season. Yeah, I I think I'm gonna go. I there think, hasn't one of these picks so far where I have any where you con- feel good any conviction. No, it's this this is a, that's why I think it's a good slate. Yeah, but here's the deal: I only pay attention to the games that I think I can understand the line. Sure, and you haven't picked one yet. Yeah, I'm I'm putting you in the games that I like. Yeah, I know it's fine. Not that I like to bet, just that I think I'm going to like to watch. Yeah, right. Um, LSU, Texas A and M, two and a half. So I'm going to take LSU because mm. I'm very principled. What's your principle? Less than a key number at home. The teams are even. Mm. So you either take A&M on the money line, but they won't win by two and a half. That, take, that I feel good. I, I feel good about. I'll take a, I'm taking A&M here. So listen, you're going to give me 135 on the money line. Oh, I'll just take the money line. That's fine. Okay, 135 on the money line. Yeah. But two and a half is 110. No, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, get either. It, no, for take, the money, for the money at one hundred percent. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go A and M, the play yeah. is the money line. Yep, I one hundred percent agree yep. there. Yep. Um, which you can do whatever you want over a warhorse. You, you can do. do whatever you want. You can, no, that's whatever. You, that's C, that's Ti, not that's Texas A and M. That's oh, different. All right. I think LSU might be a little fraudulent, okay. and I think A and M's defense is really good. Yeah. A and M got dinged really hard for a loss to a good Notre Dame team. <laughs> I mean, the, the, just the back and forth on Wegman is incredible. Yeah, I'm not a huge Wegman oh, he's guy. Good. He's not good. That's oh, my. They're better without him. Oh, he didn't play. Oh, good. I, I I'm not know. a huge Nussmeier guy either, though. So, Get, um, although he's cooking, he's playing. Yeah. He's playing better. Uh, last one that I've got, and then you can tell me why I didn't pick any of the right games. <laughs> SMU and Duke. <laughs> Selfish. <laughs> oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> Nothing See, I like to bet on games on. that I want to watch mm-hmm. instead of watching games that I bet on. Oh, less anxiety? No, it's just I, I want to have a stake a in the bet, games. A, that what, I, another vested interest? Yeah, I would like having a stake in a game I want to watch. What a wackadoodle. I am a weird guy. SMU Duke. It's minus 11 and a half for the ponies. You know I'm a big Mustangs guy. So. Yeah, I'll I'll take SMU. SMU eleven and a half. Can I get a dog in there? Is LSU the only dog that I like? LSU is the only dog. I'm kind of took. a dog guy too. I'm going SMU as well. The only favorites that I took were A and M and SMU. The rest I was riding dogs. All right, so which ones did I miss? Well, I, I'm I just I'll can I bet that dog. I'm gonna give you a way to make easy money. Can I bet you, that dog? It's gonna happen today. What's up? Uh, number one, take the Rams. You like the Rams today? Yeah, uh, and. Um, Plus three? Yep. Feel really, really good about that. They have to win this game. And I'm going to pick against the eventual Stanley Cup champion tonight. Mm. I'm going to take the Boston Bruins at home. The Boston Bruins? At home. Are they playing the Avalanche? No, the other NHL <laughs> champion from this year, the, the <laughs> Dallas Stars. <laughs> Dallas is going to win the Cup. Ba- uh, Boston Bruins at home. Yep. Against Dallas. Correct. That's your one. And and, and the Rams. Rams plus three yeah. against the Vikings. Yep. Is that just must win for the Rams? I just like the matchup. Mm-hmm. And I like the line better. And what you guys can do after you go 2-0 tonight, you just come to this back door. I like snacks to get on the plane because <laughs> I don't eat a lot of – they have like some bad stuff. Make sure they're meat snacks though, guys. Meat, meat snacks. And just leave it at the door. DB's, I'll let you in. DB's here for meat snacks. I'm here for Bet On It, brought to you by Warhorse Sportsbook. We'll be back with Bob Nightingale to talk a little World Series here on Herd Out Sports Radio. Talking baseball. Welcome to Herd At Sports Radio. Fittingly into the glove of Juan Soto. And the Yankees back to the World Series for the first time since 2009. On the backs of a bullpen and the big three of Judge, Stanton, and Soto, they win it 5-2. This should do it. Taylor collects on the first, and it's over. The Dodgers have captured the National League pennant, and they're headed to the World Series. The Dodgers 
beat the Mets at six and win it here tonight, 10-5. Wrapping up the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN, Tri-Cities, Kefawar, and Lincoln. We're joined now by Bob Nightingale. He covers Major League Baseball for USA Today. Bob, how are you this morning? Yeah, doing good, thanks. Bob, I got to ask, just from a national perspective, this was best-case scenario for World Series matchup, right? Yeah, I mean, this is what uh, MLB wanted. Uh, obviously, Fox TV, sponsorships, everything else. I'm always uh, dreamed of having another New York LA World Series. You know, been a long, long time, forty three years. One well, it's not just the, the locations, right? You also have the basically the two biggest stars in baseball in the World Series, which we haven't had in I I mean it's been a really long time. Yeah, you got a uh which I think I just had yesterday about eight or nine potential, you know, future Hall of Famers playing this game too. Mm. You know, whether you're talking about, you know, Clayton Kershaw obviously will you know, being in the Hall of Fame, but, you know, make Derek Cole and Judge and Stanton, of course, Otami and, and Betts and on and on, uh, Freddie Freeman. So a lot of star power. Yeah, I, I so I want to start this. Now, you're, again, Bob, you're, you know, you're talking to a diehard Dodgers fan. So I'm going to start on the other side with the Yankees. At what point do you think we either forgot, realized, or re-realized that Garrett Cole is, appears to be I don't know. It's not old form, but maybe this was pitching better than we thought post coming back from injury, especially later in the season. Yeah, I mean, he's a, uh, you know, pitched well, sometimes been dominant, sometimes just been so so. Uh, be interesting to see how he does. Uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, good in the postseason, but not lights out by any means. And I think he's the X factor. I think uh, That's, if, if I do Derek too. Cole pitches lights out next two games, his two start to win the World Series. If he struggles, I think they lose the World Series. Bob, with Yamamoto, obviously, you know they've tried to uh, stretch him out a little bit, get, getting a week off. With the way that the series breaks, he could. Pro- he do you think with five days in between, he could get two starts? Yeah, that's where they line him up that way. Uh, he needs five days between uh, starts where you know, normally it's four days. So that's why I have Jack Flurdy go number one. Uh, so he can go games one and five. And Yamamoto, with that off, you know, with those two off days after his start and then after game five, allow us to go games two and six. Bob, with this matchup, how, how do you kind of handicap these two teams in terms of? Who you think is more complete for this specific series? I think the, uh, the Dodgers are the more complete team. You know, they're banged up rotation wise, but it hasn't hurt them yet. Uh, Yankees have a better starting rotation. Uh, you know, Yankees, you know, on top of the lineup, you know, might be better than the Dodgers. I think the uh, Dodgers, you know, by the lineup it, it is better than the Yankees. Uh, you know, let's face it, when the Yankees Started the playoffs, you know, once Houston got knocked out first round, once Baltimore got knocked out, they were almost home free. Mm. For the Dodgers, I think they feel like their World Series was a vision series with the big San Diego Padres. And you can argue the Padres might be the second best team in baseball. That's interesting. Hey, Bob, when you take a look at the bullpen game, obviously the Dodgers had to throw more than one. It's obvi- it's not ideal. But but are very have been very good with just the one game scenario. When you look at how this series could potentially break down, you call Cole maybe the, the the X factor. But what about the bullpen game for the Dodgers? Can if you're their opponent and the Dodgers win a bullpen game, I, is that just the way that it is because of the arms that they have, or is that one that you feel an opponent has to have? No, I mean it's, it's work, but it's not necessity. I mean, hey, if they had uh, Tyler Glasnow healthy. You know, Dustin May and these guys, Kershaw, it'd be a different story. So, uh, you know, did not work for the uh, Dodgers in game two of the uh, NLCS, but, you know, worked the last game. So, uh, so it's not necessary. So they're going to have it either in game three or four, you know, depending how game two goes. And, you know, they may have to use it again in game seven. Yeah. So, you know, it's an, it's an ugly look, but it's been an effective look. Bob, I know there's been some teams in the past that have been successful kind of relying on the bullpen more heavily the way the Dodgers have, but I'm trying to remember, 
in your kind of Rolodex, has anybody won the World Series with the level of starting pitching injuries that the Dodgers have had this year? Because I, I, I'm coming up empty. Yeah, that doesn't jump out. You know, the team that would have been the closest probably would have been uh, Cleveland in 2016. Mm. And they were just so banged up injury-wise. Remember Trevor Bauer had the drone incident. And they were down to like one starter and relievers. Uh, Andrew Miller was going like three or four innings a game by the bullpen. So that would have been the closest, uh, I think. But no, you're right. I can't think of all these uh, you know, teams, all the injuries going this far. You know, Gavin Stone was a most consistent guy. You know, now he went Tommy John surgery. Yeah. So, I mean, Flaherty, they're, they're like they got Flaherty. I mean, he was supposed to go to the Yankees, hmm. and the Yankees rejected straight the last second because he passed, he passed the physical. So, let, Bob, I've watched these guys. I'm not going to say all 162, but it's a lot. And <laughs> I, one of the reasons I didn't like the Dodgers until the postseason was because I just felt fundamentally they were pretty flawed. And even in regular season games, then all of a sudden I, I switched last minute to, t- to like the Dodgers to make the run because nobody else did. But in the same time, they played a little more small ball, too. They have sack guys. They've moved guys. They've ran, obviously, with Otani and, uh, and some guys. Is this a different kind of team down the stretch? Is it an anomaly? Is it? situationally it just kind of fit with the way that the two first two series went they've showed a little bit different of a team than they have during the regular season yeah remember now the uh the uh, position players they get healthy uh so they're very versatile i mean you know i think your man is to play you know shortstop third second center field you know Mookie best can play all the diamond uh you know muncie third and first so that helps too, and, and uh, they have a Tommy Edmund. Uh, without Tommy Edmund, they're not in the same situation either. Yeah, they're, Edmund can they're play in trouble. All on the diamond, <laughs> and he plays old ball. And he hits home runs. I mean, who thought that when they trade for him, they trade him for the uh, you know NLCS MVP? Bob, I'm going to ask you a question. DB, don't listen to this one for a second. Um, so uh, the Dodgers obviously have had some kind of high profile. Uh, shortfalls in the postseason recently is that something you factor in at all when you're looking at this series or you say hey new year new team even though you've got some of the same pieces including off maligned manager dave roberts yeah i say you know new team everything else and even you know with the uh, criticism of dave roberts you hear about Aaron Boone too is that hey a lot of these moves are you know prescripted by the front office oh uh, mm-hmm. yeah he's the guy but, but it's not like it's not like he's making these moves. These moves are said, okay, we're, we want to do this. You know, if this guy's fishing this well, pull him out for five innings. So uh, a lot of those moves have already been dictated. So no, I think uh, I think the Dodgers are a very hungry team. Uh, yeah, they won in 2020. But it was a COVID year. You know, the, you know, it's almost an asterisk next to it. Uh, you know, they never did have a parade. So they keep talking about the parade over and over again. You know, when they haven't had one since 88. Uh, but this is the fourth World Series in eight years. You know, the Yankees haven't been on the stage since 2009. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's bigger for the Dodgers to win than the Yankees just because the Dodgers have already been in this situation so often. I, I, you threw me for a curveball bringing up the Edmund trade. People forget the Kopech was in that trade as well coming over from the White Sox, and that did not work out. Uh, Bob, let me ask you something about, like, the – Going back to the managerial thing, so it's not like the the Yankees and Boone like he's not he. It's not like he's been above criticism either. He's had his fair share during this stretch. How important do you think this postseason run was for him, considering that Roberts gets a lot of the discussion? Well, I think for uh, Boone, the Yankees <clears throat> excuse me, the Yankees had to make the playoffs, or I think you would bet. He would have gotten let go. Yeah, I think once they got in, he was safe. I think mean, Dave Roberts is like if they had lost the first round to the Padres again, he might have been in serious trouble. I'm not sure we got fired, but it would have been under discussion for sure. So now you know now both guys are home free. Both guys are free agents at the end of the year, uh, at the end of next year. Uh, you know both guys are college rivals. They played against each other. You know Boone was at USC. Roberts was at UCLA. So they know each other quite well. So it'd be kind of a 
fascinating uh, you know, matchup uh, with, with these two guys. Bob, I want to go back with you real quick. Got about a minute left here. Uh, obviously, the passing of uh, Fernando Valenzuela this week was a uh, was a huge story, and you know that's the last time these two teams matched up with each other. Can you kind of just give some context to the cultural phenomenon that that was back in '81 for people like me that weren't here yet? Yeah, I mean, just because you know when Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, <clears throat> you know he became. Black America's team, hey, you know, the Dodgers are our team. When Fernando came with the Dodgers, <clears throat> it's like every Mexican, American, Latino said, hey, the Dodgers are my team. And even today, you know, the stands are probably more than 50% uh, Latino fans, you know, at least over a third for sure. Uh, you know, there's so much pride and culture, and that's because of, uh, of Fernando. And, uh, and just a terrific human being, never talking to himself, never getting out to the clubhouse. His did his work in the broadcast booth, but terrific guy. But I think all the uh, uh, the cultural thing, everything else, as, as far as the uh, civic pride with the Mexican Americans, is because of Fernando Valenzuela. I love the Dodgers because of Valenzuela and Pedro Guerrero. So I'm, I'm mad at Ravi for getting me in my feelings, but I appreciate the reverence, Bob. He's he's one of my all time favorites. Yeah, like I said, just a. Uh, Terrific guy. I saw him you know, two times this summer. Every time I saw him, he looked worse. But even, you know, he, he was dying of cancer and didn't want to, didn't want to talk about it. He didn't even tell people what was going on, but, you know, everybody knew what was going on. Bob, thanks so much for the time, and uh, enjoy the World Series. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Bob. All right. My pleasure. Take care, guys. That's the show for today. Join us tomorrow right here on Herd Out Sports Radio.